So the Montpelier Roxbury uh, School Board actually was called to order at 5:30. Went to executive session. Uh, so we are in order now. Um, first, thanks everyone for showing up. I know that we have two important topics tonight: uh, the after-school programming <coughs> and the budget. I just want to run through the agenda quickly so people are clear on where, what, how we're doing this procedurally. Uh, we're going to have. Um, public comment immediately, but it's public comment on anything other than the after school programming and the budget. So if you want to speak on those, there's going to be opportunity for comment uh, later. We're going to first have a presentation from uh, some alumni, uh, and then Libby is going to give a presentation on the after school programming. Uh, then Alex Robb is going to make some brief comments. Uh, then we're going to have a half hour for public comment on the after school programming. Uh, if people could queue up, I'm just going to do a rough guess from the queue and try to give everyone an amount of time, you know, hopefully no less than a minute. Uh, if we have more than 30 people, I'll extend the comment. Uh, uh, we'll take, we'll write down questions during the comment, and then after that, Libby will answer the questions, then we'll have a board discussion, and then we will have the budget presentation, uh, which will be given by Grant, and then we'll have another period for public comment on the budget. So uh, if you have, if your comment deals with either the after school programming or the budget, um, please use that time to make the comment, not the current public comment time. Um, so, uh, first order right now, we have public comment not related to the budget or after school. So if anybody has public comment on other issues, uh, please step up to the microphone. Great. Thank you. Um, first order of business is the consent agenda. Um, do I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? So moved. I'll second. second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Great. Consent agenda. And then uh, next is the alumni panel. And thank you, everyone, uh, for coming. Uh, we don't have our usual table. So I don't know how you want to do it. If you want to go up to the microphone, you can come sit next to Becky if you'd prefer to you know, sit down and present, um, however you want to do it. Um, they're just going to come and speak a bit on their experience as alums. This is how Montpelier Public Schools prepared them, uh, what they're doing now. Yeah, oh, sorry. So, yeah, so if you could just please come up and, and introduce yourself. And, you know, uh, thanks again for coming. Okay. That's not going to make your voice louder. It's connected to the yeah. camera back there. But Got you feel it. free to speak into it, please. Yeah, and feel free to sit down, too. And, you know, <laughs> the other one. Okay. Um, my name is Jackson Marco. I'm a first-year student at the University of Southern California and a graduate of the 2018 uh, Montpelier High School Class of 2018. So I graduated just last summer. And wait a minute, hold on. I was in the back and I understood just how impossible it is to hear back there. So yep. if you can stand like this maybe, then maybe your voice yeah. will sorry about it. It doesn't oh yeah, okay. It's not a PA system. Oh okay. Cool. Yeah, you can just face the front. Just face the front. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Here you go. So um, I graduated in the class of 2018 of Montpelier class. Yeah, I think we can hear the better here because I don't have a fan. Okay, okay sounds good. good. Um, the, uh, yeah, like I said, I'm a first year student at USC um, in California. I'm studying aerospace engineering. And um, so what would you like me to sort of elaborate on? We'd just love to hear about how you know, your experience at Montpelier well, now Montpelier Roxbury Public Schools, but for you, Montpelier Public Schools, um, how prepared you? Uh, or didn't. Or didn't, you know, things that you found helpful, things that you feel maybe you didn't, experiences you didn't get that you would have appreciated getting. Um, you know, how you feel you compare to kind of now peers across the country who went through different high schools. Yeah, um, I think it prepared me really well. Um, I've 
obviously met a lot of my peers at USC and talked to them in various ways about how their high school experiences were. Um, and I think, you, I think um, Montpelier High School and Montpelier Public Schools um, prepared me really well uh, in a lot of different ways, um, especially in the sort of personalized attention that I got. And I think part of it was by design, and part of it um, may have had to do with the fact that it's just a really small public school. Um, I don't know what percentile it is, but I haven't met anybody yet at USC who went to a public school as small as MHS, um, which certainly benefited in some ways, but in other ways I think it was really uh, a well-designed education that gave care to individual students. And um, from my point of view, uh, teachers and I think administrators put in a lot of effort to make it so. Um, anything specific in terms of uh, that's great. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Sorry, I'm just going to keep doing this. Mm -hmm. okay, that's um, sorry. And next. Noel. You didn't have to use a microphone, or people at home might be able to. Yeah, uh, yeah you can, I think it's. A, I think it adjusts too. If you want to. Okay. Us. I'm Noel Rabbi Williams, and I'm also a first year student at UVM uh, at your school. <laughs> um, and I think my player prepared me more in my CBL learning. I did CBLs every high like year of my high school career. Um, and people at my school now, they're like, "What's a CBL?" And I was like, "Oh, like I, it's a community learning." based learning program that I was a part of. And they were saying how I'm well beyond like experience-wise for my, because I want to be a pediatrician, and I got to shot my own pediatrician. Um, and they like didn't have that experience at their schools. So I think <coughs> CBL really was one aspect that helped me prepare for college. That's great. Oh, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. My name is Zach Ruff. I'm a sophomore at Keene State College. Um, I'm going into elementary education with a secondary in history and a minor in Holocaust and Genocide Studies. Um, I think MHS prepared me and also kind of not didn't prepare me, but I think responsibility-wise, I didn't take it into my own actions to become a responsible young adult. I slacked off a lot in high school, not even going to lie about it. I think the resources <laughs> I think the resources were absolutely there, and I started to realize that the older I got, um, you know, junior, senior year. I also did some CBL learning, like Noel said. Um, I think that helped me a lot because that really showed me my love for children and teaching and wanting to teach elementary school when I'm older. And um, yeah, I think like everything here can prepare you well as long as you take your own re responsibility. To Hi, my name is Jacob B. Hill Brown. Uh, I'm a second year student at Cornell University majoring in information science. Um, I graduated MHS in the class of 2017. Um, and I think that uh, Montpelier did a pretty good job of preparing me for school or for college. Um, I've really, uh, since being in college, I've really come to appreciate the kind of the small uh, like classroom setting environment that MHS has. Um, I know now I have like lectures with 600 people in them, and being able to sit down in a classroom with like 20 other students here at MHS was a really valuable experience. Um, also, just like echoing some things from before, having uh, resources here um, and people that will are willing to pay attention to you, um, especially like in the guidance office, helping you figure out which classes to take, um, and the college apps and things like that. Um, and overall, for a, a smaller public school, I think MHS did a, a good job preparing me for college. Um, I know a lot of my classmates now came from larger, uh, larger schools, um, like specialized schools and private schools. Um, and 
since I'm I'm in like a STEM major, I'm a little biased here. Um, but I think that MHS, I know they have um, a lot of like science, some science and technology courses. Um, one of my favorites was AP Computer Science, um, and I think that's something that. I know when I was a student here, there wasn't a lot of interest in, um, and I think that's something that could be promoted more. Uh, but overall, I think MHS did a good job. Hi, everyone. Um, I'll try to speak up so you can hear in the back. My name is Maggie. Um, I'm a third year student this year at Stanford University. I graduated in the class of 2016. Um, and I, I really just can't speak highly enough of my experience here um, at Montpelier High School. Um, I, think, I think the most important thing that I would emphasize about my experience um, would also be the CBL community-based learning um, program with Matt McLean. I'm not sure where he's seated here um, <laughs> in the back. Um, I had the opportunity throughout high school to do, have this really unique experience where I would take classes in the morning and then in the afternoons, I would go out and intern with, um, I did an internship with Cabot Creamery and Ben and & Jerry's and their corporate offices. Um, it was just this extremely valuable, um, non-traditional high school experience that I think really ended up being what was able to tip the scales for me in college admissions because I was able to sort of speak to having both, you know, the traditional classroom experience, but these like whole wealth of other experiences outside of that. And even now as I'm applying to <coughs> jobs that I'm hoping to be out of college, most of the experience on my resume is still the jobs that I had in high school, which is really a pretty amazing thing. Um, and the other thing that I would definitely speak to is just um, the small school experience. I'm now also at a large university where most people had you know, hundreds or thousands of people in their classes. And I think I really relate to the small town, just compassionate environment, I think, that you find here. Um, and I really emphasize that too on college applications. It's really a unique experience, I think, to be able to grow up in such a small place where you, everyone's really cared about. So I can't thank you all enough. And especially, again, this community-based learning program is incredible. Hi, I'm Willa Fortunoff. Um, I'm a sophomore at McAllister College in the Twin Cities, and I was also in the class of 2016 um, at MHS, and I completely agree with everything that's been said so far, especially in regards to the CBL program. Um, I think that creating your own community-based learning plan requires a lot of motivation and self-initiative, which isn't really required in many other high school classes typically. Um, and I'm now a current political science major, Spanish minor, and human rights uh, minor, and I gained a lot of really applicable skills in high school that are now translate directly into those majors. So I did a, I think an internship with a human rights organization called Witness that has an office nearby in Montpelier, and that directly translates into my minor. Um, I was able to spend a semester off school traveling. Um, I'm not sure if you still have the SOAR flexible learning pathway program here, but that was around when I was in school, so I was able to take a semester off and get credit for that, which was hugely important. It relates to my Spanish minor, and then I was also able to work for Bernie's 2016 presidential campaign um, as a senior in high school, um, and that also directly translates into my political science major. So again, um, none of my classmates, current classmates in McAllister really were able to have this level of real world experience as a high school student. So I'm really grateful for that opportunity. Thank you. Any questions from the board? Great. Well, thank you all. It was, it was great to hear about your experiences. and. Uh, thanks for taking time off your break to come in, and good luck going back to school. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we all just the yeah, we're working now. Uh, just give us a second to look in.
thank you all for coming tonight. Um, I'm going to do for some presentation on after school. Before I start, though, um, I do want to extend my sincerest apology for messing up on process. I did that. Um, I messed up on some communication. I messed up on timing. I'm still new at the superintendency thing, so I apologize to the board members here. I also apologize to the parents. Um, and I have apologized to the people who work at Community Connections already, but I extend that apology again. I messed up. And I'm going to learn from this experience, and I'm going to do better next time. So I wanted to say that first, prior to this whole presentation around after school. Um, and then also say that if, sorry, if there's one thing that we're going to um, hit upon tonight is this theme of spending this first six months of my tenure at super, of superintendency and the leadership team we're really looking at what are our systems and structures that are currently in place, and how do those systems and structures relate to the board's vision for the for what the students are here at Montpelier High School. I've spent a lot of time doing that with my leadership team. After school is one component of that, but you're gonna hear multiple components through our budget presentation later on today. And there's this, const this theme of how do we create systems and structures to get to this vision. So Jim, if you fast forward there. This is the vision, just in case people haven't seen it. Um, it's on all our letterhead. The board has, has adopted this as our schools are caring, creative, and equitable communities that empower children to build on their talents and passions to grow and to engage citizens and lifelong learners. So our goal with the budget and with um, after school as a piece of this is to re build systems and structures to reach that. Um, so with that, we can go into the data. Um, Andrew, can you, is there, is there a light switch that you could hit just to make it easier to see? Maybe a, oops, oops. <laughs> Yeah, that's good, too. that's better. Um, so, some of the, I want to start with what we're valuing as a leadership team for after school in particular. What we really want value is providing child care for students after school that is affordable for families that can provide enriching and engagement opportunities that get kids moving in particular. When I say moving, I'm talking exercise, kind of get, getting away from the screen, getting going, uh, moving those bodies and, and using their brain in a different way than they have all through the six hours that we have them at school. And that is accessible to those who need it. Um, we want to provide equitable opportunities for all of our students in terms of after school programming. And we also really want to target and grow this extended day opportunity for our adolescents. So when I'm thinking of adolescents, I'm thinking of students in the 10 to 15 year old age range. There is so much research, it's quite clear, and there's no debate about the research, about what matters for kids and adolescents with their brain growing and changing. And we know all of that research. We know that kids at that age need caring adults that they connect with so that they, may, they have somebody to talk to about the choices they're making and some of the choices they're not making. Um, that we know that kids who are outside and exercising and using their bodies in different ways, that's better for kids and it's better for brain development. We know that kids who have connection to something and or someone tend to make better choices in that age range. So we really want to think about and target that adolescent. We value that research, we value <coughs> that belief. We completely believe in it as well. And so we want to provide opportunities in that age range, I'm calling them the adolescent, um, to get kids outdoors and exercising. We want to continue building equal or quality relationships with positive adults. We want to continue to build their confidence and life skills, just what these wonderful um, young adults were talking about today, to make them stronger people. Um, and we want to cre create positive connections between groups and people in the community. I recognize we have that for this age group for some of our adolescents. So when we think about moving forward, we want to think about how do we grow that. So as I did my kind of what I'm calling my road show in the beginning of my tenure here at superintendency, I'm looking for themes that stand out. And concerning after school, there were several themes. The major theme was that there's a lack of after school options here in Montpelier. Um, that our current after school programming has considerable wait lists that the library is absolutely swamped with children every day, particularly in this adolescent range or age group, um, that we have considerable liability concerns, as I was talking to the superintendent in Washington Central that I'll get to later, that we have considerable liability concerns with our current programming for both school districts. Um, and then parents are also saying these services aren't equitable. If I can't get in my paperwork at the right time because I don't know about it, I don't get in. 
for my kids waitlisted and I'm not sure what to do. Um, we also know, that's from kind of the parental side, that our, we have a theme of increasing enrollment. That's something we celebrate here at Montpelier Roxbury. We're, we're one of the only ones who can say that across Vermont. Um, in 2020-21, our models are projecting to have approximately 100 more students. So when I think about that, in terms of after school, our needs are not going away. They're going to increase over the next few years. Just in society in general, there's an increase in safety concerns. We all know who are sitting in this room that the world that we grew up in is not necessarily the one that our kids are growing up in. There's an increased safety. And even though Montpelier is a very safe community to live in, we're not immune to, to some risks that are happening right now. Um, we have increases across the board in single working parent families and two parent working families. It's very hard to survive in this economy without two working parents. Um, so we have an increase in that, which, which also requires an increase in the need for childcare. We have capacity building needs across our district. Um, and we have a need that we've heard from various people from financial responsibility and doing all the things we need to do. So when we're thinking about our after school child care options at UES in particular, just some data that we're looking at. We currently have 432 students enrolled at Union Elementary School. That is this current school year. Um, our current after school capacity is approximately 70 students. That's only 16% of students that can access the after school opportunity. Not the students that, that would access them if they could. Um, that, that's it. That's the limit we have, 16% of our students. Um, that provides a serious equitable issue, equity issue. Uh, our enrollment projections at UES, our models are showing that that increase is going to happen by five kids and then it's going to stay stable for the next few years after that. So that need for after school care is not going to go away. Um, we are going to continuously have a need for what happens to my kid after three, three o'clock at Union Elementary School. Our current registration process has a very short window. It creates challenges for new families in particular to our school district who do not know what that window is. Um, and also to working families who don't have the, the availability to stop what they're doing in order to fill out a registration form and get it in on time. Um, and this is a really real need. I have a call from a parent this beginning of the school year that says, I didn't know, I'm new to your school district, I didn't know the window, it was very short, I didn't get my paperwork in on time. I filled it out the way I was supposed to. I got it in when I got it in, and I was told that there's no way that my kid will get after school care. What am I supposed to do? I didn't have an answer for it. Um, and that, that same conversation was repeated often with Ryan Harity, our new principal at Newton Elementary School as well, with several families. Because it's a first come, first serve basis, people get the registration forms in on time and know the schedule are the ones that are going to get into the, to the after school care. Everybody else will have to figure it out. So at, in the beginning of the year, we have large wait lists. I know some of the board meter members have asked, what are those wait lists? That wait list is hard to say because when parents like, get on it, and then they have to figure something else out for their kids, they take their kids off of it. So it's kind of hard to give an exact number as to what that wait list is. Um, however, we have large ones in the very beginning when the process is happening. At Main Street Middle School, our total current enrollment right now is 365 students. We have 95 fifth graders, so 95, 10, and 11 year olds. Um, that's an age that, I, when I was talking to Alex Robb on Monday, said some fifth graders can handle that alone time, some cannot. Um, and we need to figure out what to do, particularly with the fifth and sixth grade population. Our current after school capacity at Main Street Middle School is 25 kids per day. That's not 25 new kids each day, that's 25 kids per day that are often repeats from days before. Um, and so that service is 7% of our students. Not, that's like the entire Main Street, that's not just the 5th graders and the 6th graders, but 7% of our students have access to that after school opportunity. 93% of our students do not. Um, enrollment projection increases at the mid middle school are much bigger than at Union. Um, so you can see the numbers right there. This is only going to decrease our opportunities to 6% of our students across the next three years. And in, in addition, we've heard multiple parents really frustrated with the registration process, and we want to increase equal access to that registration process. If you're in the know and know when the pamphlet comes out and can get it back to Community Connections really quickly, 
and have the ability in your employment to do that, you're in. If you can't, you're not. And so we have, that's a, when you're talking about 93% of our students, that's a lot of people who are on the not side. Okay. We also looked at financial considerations. <laughs> Currently, Montpelier Roxbury budgets $36,250 to go to after school. In fiscal year 20 in our budget, we have $37,338. This is paid directly to Washington Central Supervisory Union. Community Connections is not a business in and of itself. It is Washington Central Supervisory Union. So therefore, we cut a check to Washington Central Supervisory Union for that amount of money. That amount of money is put into one pot of money at Washington Central. Um, so in addition to our three schools, five schools at Washington Central pay into the same pot that, that is worked through for after school care. Um, this provides some bu budgeting challenges and financial challenges for Washington Central. Cer certainly, it's some liability issues and money, and money um, taking care of money. Main Street budgets $2,610 for additional homework help that's tied to after school. For next school year, UES budgeted $2,268 in additional funding because they wanted to increase the opportunity for club type activities like STEM opportunities and kindness and friendship club um, that the current after school provider couldn't provide for them. So they, had, they had budgeted additional funding for that. In addition, the city of Montpelier adds $5,000 as a grant to after school funding. That money is paid to Washington Central as well. So in total, for uh, next year, it's $47,216 is paid to after school before parent contributions. So taxpayers are paying for child care to another school district. Um, this creates this idea that um, Community Connections is owned by Washington Central, that it's actually just Washington Central Supervisory Union. Community Connections is an arm of that. Creates significant ownership and liability issues for our school systems, not just ours, but theirs as well. Um, Washington Central currently provides all human resources support. So the employees for Community Connections are actually Washington Central Supervisory Union employees. Um, they, they do their payroll, they do human resources, they do all the accounts payable. The insurance has a star next to it because that's where the considerable liability comes into play. Washington Central uses National Life as their insurance agent, whereas Montpelier Roxbury uses BizFit. The two insurance agencies have not talked to each other or formalized who is responsible for what. And thank heavens in the past 15 or so years that this, this partnership has gone on. There's been no big, big um, crises. However, if there were, we don't know who would pay for it or who would have the financial responsibility or anything else around that because there's no formalized process with this. Um, both Bill Kimball, the superintendent at Washington Central, and I have talked about this. Um, he's actually the one who brought it to my attention the most. Washington Central also provides legal support. They do all the processing for payments, and all the transportation that's available for after school is done through Washington Central Supervisory Union. So speaking of transporting students, the Washington Central, the vans that have been used for after school purposes are the property of Washington Central. They're leasing those. This year, because of liability concerns and because those vans cost a considerable amount of upkeep to Washington Central, uh, they said we are give, giving up that lease in February. That was pl planned on before I got here. That I was told right when I got here in July that that was happening. Um, because I called Washington Central to say, hey, could we use those vans because we want to run a lake bus for Roxbury? And we were, they, we were told, absolutely not. That is a liability issue. You may not use those vans for that. So because of that, we got two new vans. We, so we now own um, two vans. Montpelier Roxbury owns that. We had planned on doing that because we were going to lose those vans that were provided to us by Washington Central. So those vans in Montpelier Roxbury will be used for community-based learning. And they provide the Roxbury Lake Bus. Um, and they also can be used for extended day enrichment opportunities. However, when we got those vans, um, Grant and some other people on the leadership team started looking at what are the laws and rules around transporting students, and this law came and came up. I'm not going to read it for you, but it is on the slide because the next slide um, tells it pretty simply. According to Vermont law, you can only transport more than five students in any kind of van. It doesn't matter if you have the capacity to, to, to drive 25 kids in the van. You can only do more than five. If you display a school bus sign with red flashing lights and have a driver with a Type 2 license, which is essentially a school bus driver's license. Um, we have nobody on staff, nor is Washington Central, with uh, their after school program who has that type of license. 
Um, and we can only transport five students at a time, at a time excluding the driver if the school driver is a school employee or a volunteer who has passed a criminal background check. Complying with this law further limits the opportunities that we have going on right now. And so we need to think about how are we doing this, how are we building our capacity in this way so that we can increase opportunity. So here is our plan. Our plan is to bring in a child care provider at UBS and Main Street that has the ability to increase our capacity for child care with, without any monetary support from the school district. We need to offer scholarships and a rolling scale to support families financially. We do that by, by in lieu of rent, we're using our building. Uh, the provider would give scholarships and develop a rolling scale in lieu of that rent money um, that we charge people for using our building. This program would need to be a licensed program with three stars. When you're at three stars, then you can take child care subsidies, furthering the support for families in need. Um, we need to have a pro provider that can increase our offerings, so more students at UES and MSMS can access. We need to build potential programs. So we're thinking about how do we provide full day preschool in the future. That is a further driver for getting young families to come, come live in Montpelier and Roxbury. And we also have a need at, at RVS. Currently, they're tied to Central Vermont under a grant, under the 21st Century Grant for After School Care. That will be eliminated in the coming years, and we're going to need to figure out how to provide after school support in that school as well. Mm -hmm. um, community Connections was quite clear that they could not do that for us. We also need to provide a fair registration process so that all families have the chance to participate should they need to. Um, the second piece of this was to maintain and build upon current programming at Main Street in the high school using the budgeted funding for as an extended day enrichment opportunity. This is where I was not clear in my communication to parents, and I truly apologize for this because it caused a lot of consternation that didn't necessarily need to happen. There was never a plan to eliminate the programming that's happening at Main Street or the high school. That's why the money in the budget is still there, because we wanted to figure out how to grow it and how to increase that, that programming for kids. There's a couple pieces on the table, right, a couple ideas on the table right now as I talk to Alex and Drew um, to, in order to do this. And I'm really excited to collaborate with them further as they're excited to collaborate with us. One opportunity would be that they form a true nonprofit that's not tied to a separate school district. Um, and Alex is in the process of seeing how to do that right now and then collaborating with the school district of how we grow that program so more kids can access the extended day opportunities. Um, we have the money in our budget to do that. We've saved the money in our budget to do that. So we're going to do that. We're going to figure out a way to do that. And we have two legitimate ways to do it right now. And I'm sure as we continue to think about it and put more heads on that, we'll continue to think about how we can do it faster. Next year, I can probably say that that programming will look very much the same but in my plan, our plan is to grow it year upon year upon year, so we grow that 7% to more students having access. So the idea about middle school in particular is that there would be a child care, a licensed child care provider for parents who need the everyday, um, the everyday support. And there would also be an enriching extended day opportunity for students. The idea to grow the extended day opportunity but yes, keep the child care idea too that currently is unavailable to parents and families. Um, and we also have to transport students in accordance with that Vermont law, it's a big one. And we want to continue to eliminate liability concerns for the district. So that was our plan going forward. We're thinking about future needs. Our growing enrollment means we're going to need more support for new families. We need to continue that growth. We don't want to see our model to Prove to be wrong. We want to see our model prove to be right and wrong in the other direction, where more families are coming in because we can support them in the way they need to be supported. So I think having a strong, robust after school and extended day program for our adolescents is one way to do that. Um, so we want to see how we can grow that opportunity. Like I said earlier, Roxbury Village School will be in need of after school services in the next three years or so. Um, and we need to figure that out. We need to decrease liability concerns across the district in, in a few other ways, not just in after school, but after school is certainly one area. We want to potentially offer full day preschool to further attract younger families. Full, so full day preschool after school is that 
preschool would still be a half day and then we would add on after school for preschool so it becomes a full day option for families. We have some logistical challenges with that. That's not going to happen in the next year or even two years, but that's something on our plate to consider as we consider how do we grow these, these programs. Um, we want to increase the opportunities for more adolescents to build that confidence, to be out in nature, to be having quality relationships for caring adults. We don't want to take that away. We want to increase that opportunity. We have some plans in place right now to do so. Um, mm -hmm. So we just need to go with a, with a change now in order to get that happening later. That's the presentation for after school. Thanks, Louie. <coughs> I believe Alex wanted to take a few, <coughs> few minutes before I open up public comment. Thanks, Alex. <coughs> <laughs> um, I just will, I found out this afternoon that I'd be given a chance to speak. I really appreciate it. Um, I've run Community Connections now for four and a half years. Um, I work for seven school boards, uh, most of them in Washington Central, and I've never been given the opportunity to present to the board. Um, in my four and a half years now that I've been running, can people hear me? I'm sorry. In the four and a half years I've been running CC, um, I've seen a lot of changes. Um, there's only one principal left still from when I started four and a half years ago, and that's Pam in Main Street Middle School. So I think one of the things that's happened to CC over the years is this organization that came up kind of grassroots. It was formed by four groups, Washington Central, Montpelier Public Schools, Montpelier Alive, and Washington Central Friends of Education which is a booster group for um, the U32 community. And it was formed because of a need and an opportunity. And the need was to work to help the kids in Montpelier and the surrounding towns, um, give them access to after school programming. And the opportunity was um, the start of this grant program called the 21C Grants. And really what started CC was a group of community members that came together and applied and were awarded this grant. Um, and since then, CC's gone in all kinds of crazy ways over 14 years. We really adapted. Um, we have lost some partners, and the money and the assets have kind of consolidated in Washington Central Supervisor Union, as um, Libby pointed out. Um, but there's still this organization that has been created over 15 years that's got 60 people in it that we have you know, the people that have come to work from us and who have stayed because they're really good at their jobs and really want to do this job. And this, um, all the things that we do, you know, sixth grade play. Drew is right now, he's at Bolton with 60 kids after school. Um, they're all gonna be showing up here in like an hour or two. <laughs> I told him there's really good snacks, so they're probably all. But we do, <laughs> We do, you know, there's so many things. The outing club, you know, Maggie was in our outing club, and Willow and Emma is in our outing club, um, and we've done trips together here at the high school. Um, there's, it just goes on and on and on. We run the Main Street Middle School lacrosse team. We did a cross-country ski team. We started a mountain bike team last year. We have done um, the golf team this year. When students call, have an office up here and students are always coming into my room with the craziest ideas. And I feel my rule as someone operating kind of outside the budgetary process to be like, hey, I have $200 for you if you want to start a school newspaper, um, which is what we did last year with Jackson, um, who was also here presenting just a little bit ago. Um, so I look at the presentation, and I agree with almost everything Libby says in the presentation. Um, I have a few, I, I, would, I don't think that our wait lists are ridiculous, but again, it varies throughout the year. Um, one of the things that's happened at Union is that other providers have gone away. So River Rock used to have an after school program, and it's gone. Um, Carlin Coneman used to run an after school program, it's gone. So. As our capacity about three years ago was 50 kids a day. And two years ago, we increased it to 69 kids a day um, because one of these after school programs went out, went out of business. It's really hard to run after school programs over a long period of time. Um, and that's what we've done at Union. And we've addressed some of the issues that came up. I agree 
about the registration issues. Um, we've made a change in leadership at Union as a result of all that. And I have a new Heather who's running the Union now. She is completely dedicated to those will not be an issue next year. Um, so I do feel that we could meet all of these needs, but not in our current structure. I agree that it's awkward, the Washington Central Supervisory Union running after school programs in Montpelier. <coughs> I brainstormed with people over the years, here and there, um, and we've never really committed to a solution. But um, we care enough about serving this community and serving these schools that we're willing to, like, basically willing to look and do what it takes to hopefully be in place to be one of the providers that are considered for a bay next year. It will not be the CC that exists now, um, the Washington Central Supervisor Union CC, but it could be some other entity involving the same people and <coughs> the same values. Um, and I just want to add one more thing, and that's about the power of the partnership. You know, we are here in Montpelier. All the buses from Washington Central go through this community every day on the way up to U32 or East Montpelier, Berlin, Doty, Romney, um, and Callis. Um, we run our camps. We combine both communities. We have 25 kids from one town. We have 25 kids from Montpelier and 25 kids from Washington Central. They come together and it makes our camps vital and vibrant and sustainable. Um, we ran the middle school play this year. We had students from nine towns who auditioned from the play. We have my own son is a seventh grader at U32. He, the work that Drew and Dave did with him in mountain biking camp and the mountain biking team has been one of his favorite things that he's done ever. Um, he's completely into it. He has met a bunch of friends in Montpelier through that work, um, and they still ride bikes together. So here in Montpelier, you have busloads of U32 kids that are getting off the bus every day. If you go to the traffic circle, the late bus from U32 lets off, and I would guess that probably half the kids at the library actually don't go to school here. So one of the things about CC is that providing care to the kids in the towns around Montpelier who are actually helping the situation in Montpelier. Um, and so it's the, it's the relationships among the kids, the um, partnership in providing care across the community, um, and just trying to address those needs at the library. I'm gonna talk just quickly a little bit about the middle school program with Drew. Um, so our program at the middle school, we, our budget was cut from 120,000 to 30,000, $36,000, the same year that the fifth grade was moved over from Union to the middle, to middle school. So that changed that school completely, um, and it changed the after school programming needs completely. Um, we had numerous discussions about um, increasing programming there, but our program is very intentional. Drew's been doing this for 15 years. He know he has, he's not interested in running a, room, a cafeteria like this full of 60 students with a proctor sitting <coughs> in the corner because the only relationships that you're gonna develop with kids are bad ones. Um, and so he has small programs. He has small numbers, limited somewhat by the transportation issues. Um, but he wants to build relationships with kids. He wants to work with them one-on-one. -on -one. He wants small groups doing fun things, getting out of the school, going into the community, going and doing permaculture, mountain biking, backcountry skiing, Bolton, all those things. So he is limited in numbers. Um, and because he need, you know, these employees do need to get paid, the money is a limiting factor um, for what we can do every day there. Here at Montpelier High School, we basically, you know, in the younger years at Union, we say, oh, this is what you're going to do after school. At middle school, we say, hey, what do you kind of <coughs> might want to do after school? And at, mid, at the high school here is, what do you want us to do for us? So I go up at club day. I offer to incubate clubs. Any student with an idea can come up to my office. We have a grant program. We run the outing club, an anime club. Um, Dave does a whole fitness club, and there's going to be a completely new fitness facility here at the high school that's coming down the road in like, next year or the year after, um, which is really exciting. We um, have high school kids that go to Bolton. 
we did the Soul and Spectrum newspaper last year. Basically, we incubate activities where students show up in October, and there's no money for them, any budgets, but we have a little money for them, and we help them find an advisor, and we've done this for student after student after student. Um, and I work here right at the high school, and getting to know all these kids as they come up through the programs, through CC, through the schools, and they finally show up here, and we all, to we take them all canoeing um, in gym class their freshman year, we get to know all of them. Um, and it's really amazing to, just to see these, the kids that were here, and to know that they came up through everything. So I guess what I'm saying is we just would like a chance. Um, I feel that there's this thing, community connections, that's been created. Um, it, I don't see the sense in tearing it all down and starting over. I think that we can adapt and change and address the concerns and grow and do a better job in the future and continue to serve the vision and the people of Mumford. So that's my thought. For you. So thank you both, uh, Libby and Alex. Um, I think we all acknowledge that the original communication and timing of this was not what we wanted. Um, I do really want to thank both Libby and Alex for spending uh, a lot of time over the holidays uh, thinking about this and talking and you know, kind of reflecting on paths forward. Um, and I, I really like what I heard from, from both of you. Uh, so we're going to do public comment now. Again, uh, I'm just going to give a minute to people. Uh, we just be cognizant that we do have another presentation after this. Um, yeah, so try to be concise. Uh, we have another presentation, and we have, I think, zero coffee pots in the room. Uh, so um, you know, be, con be concise if you can, but I don't want anyone to not feel like they didn't have an opportunity to uh, say whatever they need to say or uh, ask a question. I'll be roll white questions down and take some time to answer those. Uh, and then uh, we'll have uh, some more discussion on the topic. So um, if you just want to queue up in front of the mic, um, and I'll keep a rough count on time and hopefully not have to exercise the new gank authority. Thank you. Um, please introduce yourself by name first. My name is Jenny Burley, and I'm the mother of Community Connections. Um, when we got the big federal grant in 2001. Yeah, and speak to the crowd because I think it's easier for the them. Crowd Remember you're on the camera, me. so kind of look for the camera. Yeah. <laughs> we might want to turn it to the Should it be on the other side? 180, I think, is. Thank you. Is this better? Yes. Okay. okay. Yeah, but great. So in 2001, um, we got a Federal 21st Century Community Center Learning Grant. It was for $1.25 million a year. And that's what it took to start after school programs in 10 communities that had never had one before. Berlin did have Kid Watch, and that was it for the entire area. So we worked really hard. We got the grant in June, and by September, <coughs> or October, we had programs running in every single school in the district. It was a massive undertaking. And it happened with this partnership between Washington Central and Montpelier. I was also on the U32 school board. I've been through four, should we join, should we get married, conversations over the years. None of them have worked. But this did, and it's actually been written up by UVM professors as a positive partnership. And it's, just, it's been around since 2001. So I'm really committed to this partnership. I'm really committed to seeing these things work. But as Alex said, funding is what it comes down to. Because there's either community funding, school funding, grant funding. And we're no longer eligible for 21st century funding because of the sizes and because of the lack of poverty in most of our schools. You have to have 50% free and reduced lunch to qualify. And we only have that in Berlin and Doty. Um, 
So what does it come down to if you can't get funding from grants, and all the federal grants are gone, believe me. I got them all while they were still around. And we, that's how we have all the mountain bikes and the canoes and all that stuff. Um, but they're not there anymore. The federal government is decimated. Safe and drug-free schools is gone. So there's the community funding. The schools have cut back. U32 gave us $70,000 a year at one point. That's gone. They don't even have a program anymore. So it comes down to parents. And we got licensed early on so that we could access childcare subsidies. We do that, we give scholarships, we give all sorts of things to make it possible for parents, but it's still not cheap. We need other funding sources if it's going to be cheap or free. It could be schools, it could be, I'm not sure what it could be, but I'd really be happy to work with Alex and help him try to figure out how to do that um, because I'd, I'd hate to see this go away. It is my baby, I'm committed to it, and it's been great for these communities. Remember in 2001 when we started, there was nothing. Parents had nowhere to go. There were a few private daycare providers. And when we started, people had to hold their slot with their daycare provider and pay them, but come to us because they couldn't afford to lose their slot if they couldn't come every day. So compared to where we were then, we're in a, a great place now, but Again, it's another crisis, um, but it's about money, and it's about equity, and it's about access. Thank you. Um, I have a cold, so I'll be as loud as I can. My name is Lisa Burns. I'm a parent of now a middle schooler and a high schooler. My kids have been through community connections from uh, elementary through high school and have enjoyed and prospered at every single um, event that they partook in. Um, they did not have any instance where they were unable to attend um, and I think in many instances Drew especially will go out of his way to max out his bus at capacity. So my one question that I would like to ask is there appears to be problems with availability of slots and whatnot, but this was, I think, something that could be addressed in a slightly more <coughs> scientific way by merely having a survey which we parents could fill out because I think that some of those 365 children at the middle school and some of the 300 or 400 whatever at the union are not interested in the program. So throwing that number up as if all of those children are being denied their opportunity, I think, gives very false figures. And I do think um, that community connections, its strongest point is that it's local. I was totally unimpressed with the website of that one um, thing. And I would just think that maybe the school board would consider asking the parents who have children in the school in a scientific way as opposed to just taking ancillary data of parents that call and complain. Thank you. Please, please, please try to stick to that. I gave Janice some more time given her special relationship with uh, CC, but um, please try to stick to the minute because I don't want to brush the people here. Sure, yeah. My name is Casey Desharnas. <laughs> My son Dax is in Drew's program at middle school. and. I love going to pick up Dax after school and seeing Drew, and Dax loves Drew. Um, so that's just a plug, but really I, I wanted to come up and just ask the question as to, um, it didn't seem like um, there was a plan, like Community Connections was approached and a plan laid out and problems addressed with them. Um, so I just was hoping to kind of see the, the reason why the school board didn't kind of go up and address community connections and see if they could meet the need or a plan was, a plan could be made to meet the need and just wondering why that didn't happen. Hello, I'm Kate Hawley. I have two sons that have taken advantage of community connections through elementary, middle school, and the high school. These are professionals who have worked with our children for years and built very strong relationships. 
My older son learned how to play lacrosse with Drew in, in middle school, now his favorite sport in the varsity level, not to mention several overnight outdoor experiences teaching outdoor survival skills, leadership, and responsibility. In high school, he has hiked Mount Washington with Dave through MHS Wild, and I would just like everyone to please understand that CC is more than just an after-school provider. It's unique, and it really makes this community special, and for that, I thank you all. Christine Zaki. Um, I want to use my time to share some thoughts that parents shared on the petition that we circulated. The last time I checked the petition, um, a couple hours ago, um, over 350 parents had signed it in support of CC and took time to make comments on there that I wanted to share. Um, one comment from a mother says that she led a CC program, a summer camp, um, and saw firsthand how important access is to this sort of quality experience for kids, especially those from low-income families in the foster care system, living with grandparents or having parents who work full time and have long commute commutes. And CC is creating access and quality opportunities for those sorts of kids. Um, another person, Ashley, commented on the petition saying, <clears throat> she grew up in this community, she lives here now, she may have children soon, she wants CC programs in the future for her future children. We need to have these sort of, sort of stable programs to encourage people, as you said, to um, live in Montpelier and have children here. A grandparent wrote in saying, my grandchildren attend Montpelier schools as a taxpayer and as um, a, 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 a parents and grandparents, they should have been consulted. Um, a single parent wrote in, Samantha, who said, community connections on their sliding scale was invaluable and she depends on them greatly. A teacher wrote in saying, community, connection pro community connections provides us with tons of support that's not even in their sphere. Community building that CC provides, especially connecting students with teachers in a recreational atmosphere is invaluable. Um, and finally, the common theme that we saw over and over again, that the relationships, as this woman Elaine said, the relationships that my children formed with their peers and with staff have lasted and are what community is based on. And those human relationships, I think, are, are why we're all here. Um, finally, I just want to close with some context. The $36,000 that's budgeted for community connections is 0.0015% of the proposed $24 million FY20 budget. I understand the fiscal restraints. I also think that we need to have some context when we talk about these numbers. Hello, um, I'm Sam Brondike. I'm in sixth grade at MSMS. I like really love CC. Like I've been doing it since like fourth grade. Like Drew, he's amazing. Like I did his like I'm on the ski team this year. I did downhill skiing with him last year. Like it's it's all really wonderful. I I I love CC. <laughs> Hi, my name's John Turner. I've lived in town for about 40 years. Two of my kids went all the way through the Mount Pelier school system, and now I have two grandchildren going through the school system using the after-school program. My big concern, I think, is around the cost. Um, right now, I think they're paying around $19, is it? Um, there is a school district in Waterville has an after-school program charging parents $3 a day. Um, I would just ask the board to be a little bit more creative in thinking about um, what we're paying for. Uh, and who's doing it. I would encourage the board to think outside the box a little long term. Um, there are a lot of people who look like me in town uh, who could be coordinated into supporting some programs. There are older school kids that could be involved in supporting an after school program. And I know, I knew at one time Mount Pillar had the uh, second per capita group of lawyers in the country other than Washington, <laughs> D.C. And my daughter's a lawyer, and, and she's a great person, and I love lawyers, but lawyers worry about liability issues, 
and they tend not to want to think outside the box. <laughs> and I think we need to if we're thinking about taking our kids, taking care of our kids after school. Thanks. My name is Jasper Eckland. I go to MSMS. I am in fifth grade. And I've been doing CC ever since I was in kindergarten. And I've loved it. They, whenever like I was feeling down, Didel would always come to me and hug me and help me feel better. Hi, I'm Peter Walk. I have two students in the middle school. Uh, I think Libby, we just want to convey to you that we understand your decision-making process that you went through, and having go, you go through this was really helpful today. But you have a community of people who want to help you solve the problems you've identified. And we hope that you engage us in that in the future. We are pretty easy to work with. This is not a hostile environment. This is a group <laughs> that wants to work better together. The other piece is, I wouldn't be afraid of the shared services model. That actually works and has worked. And the fact that we get for $36,000, whatever you said, that sort of level of service in terms of doing all of the HR and payroll and all those things for the entire community, all five schools and whatever is fantastic. Like that is not something we should be afraid of. Yeah, we should figure out the liability piece. That scares me to death, but we should, we should keep working on that if it's actually working. Thanks. My name is Sarah McCurdy, and first I just want to say, say that it's so amazing to see all these people in one room on an issue that affects the future of our schools. I mean, that is really heartening to me, to live in a community like this that is this engaged. Um, I, uh, I know that uh, this parent community can't be involved in every decision about uh, how the schools work and how the district operates. Uh, but I think that you can tell from uh, the amount of energy and concern in this room that people here feel like this is a decision that has major magnitude for our community. Uh, it has magnitude because it employs a lot of people who live amongst us, and we care about that. Um, it, has a, it has magnitude because uh, there are people who have built these programs over years and there's a lot of institutional knowledge about how to deliver good programs to this community that we will lose, lose with a quick transition uh, to another provider. And lastly, clearly, as everybody's saying, it really affects the, the quality, type, and cost of the services that are available for aftercare. Um, what I want to urge is that we slow down a little bit, um, that we design a process that is structured to allow for parental involvement and, uh, you know, not at, at every turn and, and in minute detail, but that there are thoughtful strategic places along the decision-making pathway where people can understand what's being looked at, understand not only the gaps, which I feel like we heard really compelling information tonight about gaps and challenges and problems. What I didn't hear about is what will be lost uh, in a transition away from community connections uh, and what are the options that allow us to address the gaps and do so in a way that preserves what's really special and unique about the programming and the people who deliver it here in our community. So. I, I support um, the, the let's get on it <laughs> kind of spirit um, of uh, you know, what's evolved here and a recognition that we have some problems and we have to address them. Um, I would really urge us to do that in a way that leaves everybody feeling good about the decision, understanding it, and really taking a thoughtful look at what the options are. And there may be a lot of creative options that haven't been uh, visited yet. I would urge us not to commit immediately to another organization before we have really considered what those options are and people have had a chance to weigh in on what they feel is most important. Um, thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Cassie Wilner. I am the parent of a five-year-old here in Montpelier. I also work for an organization called Vermont After School, and we are a nonprofit dedicated to increasing access and quality of out-of-school time programs across Vermont. 
Um, something that we're really interested in at Vermont After School is increasing youth voice. And I've just loved Alex sharing the stories about how you incorporate youth voice into your programming. And I hope that that is also part of this process is having youth provide input of any age, elementary school included, so that their voices are heard and what they want and need during out of school time hours. I think that's really important. Um, the last thing I wanna add is that we're um, using a new phrase at Vermont After School called third space for learning. So. We um, are looking at kids as being at home, and then they're in school, and then what they do outside of those two places is called the third space. It includes libraries, it includes after school programs, summer programs, summer camps, rec programs, karate club, gymnastics, etc. cetera. Um, and really looking at this as a broad range and saying like, what can we do for our kids in our community to make sure that everybody can access these opportunities in the third space of any age, because we want our youth of all ages to thrive. Thanks. Uh, hi, my name is Gary Holloway. Uh, I have two kids in the schools. Uh, uh, my son Forrest is at the middle school, my son Winter is at the elementary school. And um, first of all, I just want to say thanks for offering an opportunity for, for all of us to be able to have this public comment. Um, I know sometimes public meetings you can, can get squashed down to a really short amount of time, so to provide this amount of time for us to talk about this is, is terrific. So thanks for, for doing that. And also for the parents who organized a lot of our thoughts that we threw out to the wind over the holidays um, into a petition was, uh, was appreciated. Um, Everything that everyone said, um, or most of the things that folks said, I, you know, I agree with um, and in support of. I have a few other things I'd like to mention. Um, one is just you know, the public process. It's so important to have a public process around something that's so important to, to our families um, and to our kids. Um, so thanks for being willing to walk down that road of having a public process. And I don't know what that looks like, if it means um, there's going to be a committee that forms, um, you know, building off the work that's in you know, 2016. A few folks in the room here participated in, the in a committee about after school, um, so perhaps they can continue that work and build off of that. I agree with Alex, you know, don't, don't blow it up, let's, let's work with what we have because there's been a lot of work put into it over 15 years. Um, I think affordability and access for all is, is, is perhaps one of the most important. Um, you know, to be able to send your kid to golf for 50 bucks or 40 bucks for six weeks, uh, or to bolt and skiing, um, you, you know, for kids that might not otherwise have access, I think is really important. Um, so I would just hope that whatever plan is in place that you're considering the affordability and access for all. Um, I'm not sure how you do that without increasing a $36,000 commitment. Um, that's not a lot. So I would hopefully look for ways that you can increase that. And I, and I appreciate Libby, you saying that you really want to get beyond the seven to nine percent served and try to reach all, I think that's an important goal. Um, and kudos to Alex and, and Drew and the rest of the CC staff for you know, getting chopped from $100,000 or whatever that number was you said to 36,000 and still maintaining the program or even increasing, increasing it in certain cases. Um, and then finally, I just wanna say um, well, two things. One is uh, just, um, you know, Drew's amazing with the kids, and I think the relationships that the staff have um, is, is something that's hard to measure with dollar amounts uh, when you're, you know, evaluating, you know, cost. And then I, I told a friend of mine, I mentioned something around, um, uh, specifically around the elementary school and the programming there that I wasn't even aware of, that um, Community Connections offers low-income families in the Hilltop community in Berlin um, 10 hours a week pre-K plus the rest of school, after school programming, uh, and that's subsidized. So that's something that would be lost if you, you know, did away with community connections altogether. So appreciate the hybrid model and considering both. So thanks for your time. Hi, I'm Nate Anderson. I have a daughter who's at CC. Uh, she loves it. Um, just three things I wanted to say. Uh, number one, um, this all kind of came on suddenly uh, right before the break. I'm just curious where the board is on this decision-making process. Um, I would like to think that decisions have not been made and contracts have not been signed. Um, 
So if I could, that would be great to learn about. Um, there's all of this talk about 16% of students who have access to care. Uh, no mention has been made so far about those families who would lose all access to care uh, with the pricing models that are up on part two's website, nor was there any mention of um, any way that our situation would not just be what's uh, reported on their website. So, uh, you know, my wife would have to stop going back to school um, uh, if part two was our after school care option. <laughs> Uh, and finally, there was a point made about uh, local taxes being paid to support after-school care in other, count, uh, other uh, school districts. I would much rather uh, pay for that than pay for the salary for people working in Chittenden County. Great people, though, I'm sure they are. Thank you. Uh, my name is Jason Woodard. I have two daughters who came through the elementary school and are in middle school now. And as a middle school teacher at a school that lost its after school program and has really never been able to get it back, I, I definitely appreciate the situation. Um, you said it up there earlier, this is all about relationships. I mean, teaching comes down to that bottom line. And I know the current staff, those relationships are there. I mean, Heather took care of my oldest when she was this big. and. That same daughter now is, is up on the mountain with Drew, who is like a Where's Waldo, because everywhere I go with my students, a bridge building competition or a youth environmental summit, he's there. Um, so my hope is whatever decision is made, um, that that is really um, factored into it and really establishing those relationships beyond just the slotted and allotted uh, hours, because it is about helping kids feel trusted, safe, and respected is a huge piece of it. Uh, the question I do have for the board is, is there um, any plan to engage the students in terms of what they're interested in and what they would like to see in their needs? Because another thing we know in teaching is um, without student buy-in, um, the best laid plans are doomed to failure. So just sort of wondering, uh, is their voice going to be uh, taken into account somewhere? Thank you. Um, my name is Sarah Truckle. I have a 10-year-old who's a fifth grader at my, uh, Main Street Middle School, and I have an 18-month-old who's uh, currently at LoveWorks Daycare. I had a great experience with UES. My son loves Diadel, runs into her every day at the farmer's market and gives her a big hug. Uh, Drew was great for field days, but that program is not meeting my family's needs. I haven't been able to get consistent coverage at Main Street Middle School. I've had programs that were canceled that weren't able to get back, that I found out last minute, you know, 1.30 in the afternoon, there's no coverage today. Um, the programs are amazing. The people are the best people I've ever met. I would never trust anybody more than these people with my children, but it's not meeting my family's needs. And I really read the petition, and I really support everything everyone said. But I think it's really important that we also, as a community, recognize that having full-time preschool is going to be important to younger families. We're looking at buying a new house right now. It's something we're considering as we're house hunting because, I mean, I'm spending $17,000 a year for daycare between my two children. And, and that's not a joke, $17,000. So I just think it's important that as a community, we think about the younger families who are spending this money in preschool, who are spending this money in infant care, and who are moving into Main Street Middle School with a fifth grader who the experimental pro experiential programmings are great, but really do need the, you know, from three to five, they know their children are safe. And um, some of the concerns that I also think are important is I don't know how many of you have kids who spend time at the library after school. But I do, and my son has told me that there have been drugs at the library, that the police have shown up. And um, I, I think that's important that we recognize that we need to have that capacity. Um, I know it might be unpopular, but that's important. I also am willing to say that I think the, the sliding fee is great. $5 a day, though, for golf. Like, I, as a parent, would be willing to spend a little bit more money both taxpayer money and in coverage, if that meant that my child was safe after school and I had the reliable coverage. Um, there's a lot of options with scholarships, but I can think that I'm not the only parent who's willing to spend a little bit more if it means I've got the reliability. So I just wanted to kind of boost 
those concerns, but also express great love for my CC people because you guys were phenomenal, Heather in particular. Hi, my name is Catherine Nunnally. I have a pre-K, a second grader, and a ninth grader. And um, when we moved here in 2015, I had a sixth grader, um, and he's now at Moulton uh, snowboarding with Drew right now. So I just want to say uh, that I really appreciate CC. Um, it meant a lot uh, <coughs> the hard transition to middle school to have a strong male role model that Drew is to encourage my son and I just wanted to express uh, that appreciation and hope that CC will continue. My name is Lisa Neva, and I have two boys, one in Union and one at the middle school. Both are involved in the CC programs, and I can't say enough for what these instructors have done for both my boys. Whether I'm talking about Anne at our elementary school, or whether it's Drew at the middle school, my oldest was really struggling, and Drew really helped to bring him around and taught him to ride a bike. None of us could do that. Um, it's been an incredible program, and certainly I listen to these high schooler or these now college students talk about their high school experience, and what they really valued were these community experiences, these small groups. Do we need more capacity? Yes, but not if what we're doing is going back into everybody in a cafeteria doing crafts. You know, my little guy would probably be thrilled with the crafts and try and teach them. My middle schooler would refuse to go. What the real value for us at that middle school is that he's choosing activities he wants to participate in and getting to know other kids who also love those. So thank you, really appreciate it. Thank you for letting <coughs> us express our opinion. Hi, my name is Lauren Hurl. Um, I've got a seven-year-old in second grade who's been in CC um, since kindergarten and I've got a four-year-old who next year hopefully can get a slot at CC and appreciate the opportunity and having this process and echo the comments of how you know wanting a good process moving forward um, and um, you know appreciate the challenges and hope that like as other people have said that we're all in the mode of how do we solve these challenges that are very real and how can we be creative and build on the strengths of what we have um, one thing that just hasn't been said, so I just wanted to add, was it kind of gave me red flags when I saw that the provider that was in the link um, is a for-profit corporation. To me, it's like, why are you working with children? Like, if your motivation is the bottom line and profit motive as opposed to what's best for our kids and working with our, our children in the best possible way. So I just wanted to throw that out there because I hadn't heard it tonight, but I just found that strange and concerning. That's okay. Good evening, my name is Larry Forsyth. I'm actually a transplant to Vermont. I retired from the Army in 2014 and moved my family here. I was one of the folks that showed up on this slide that I had no clue that there was such a backlog to be able to get childcare. So I'm all about capacity building, but we all as a community know that we want to have a small classroom environment because that's what we have at the high school, that's what we have at the middle school, and that's what we have at the elementary school. And I'm wondering, what community partners are you involving so we can continue to do that? Who are the people that play the flute? Who are the people that play the violin? Who are the people that do these type of things as our community who wants to help you? And who are these community partners that are, that are now helping CC? Because everyone here wants to keep CC and loves everybody that we work with there. Because I have three students. They've gone from elementary school, middle school, to high school. They've gone from playing magic, to skiing, to lacrosse, you name it, we've been in it. Small classrooms, community partners, and we want to keep CC. I don't know how to do it, but heck, you can call me up on the phone anytime, I'll give you my phone number, we're willing to volunteer and help out. And I think there's a lot of us that are willing to do the exact same thing. Just point of order, um, we're a little over half an hour. Uh, I know, I see Tim. Is just report, yeah. Okay. Um, go for it. And then, does anybody else oh, want to yeah. go? Wanna I don't want to, oh. So, two more, and anyone else? Uh, okay, three more. I'll be okay, quick. Perfect. Yeah, the, the last time I was here was for 
teacher child ratios in schools and now I'm back again so our community is growing we're attracting young families as well as um, families that want to stay here I've been since, here since 2005 I've always had problems with um, getting child care I know that I went to um, Heather was my kids baby teacher um, was a lot with Steve and um, stuff but currently right now community connections I can't get my kids into their after-school program it's there's just not enough slots and um, c um, child care is, is really important. Currently, right now, sometimes on, at their, on their dad's time, they go to the library, and I don't feel it's safe for them. So for the community, we need to have a after-school program. I've always had great luck with CC. I hope we can keep it in some capacity. But we have to have a solution for our children. And I do want to continue to attract families here to Montpelier. Um, and we probably have to talk about the teacher kid ratio two again, hopefully. So <laughs> thank you. Hi, <laughs> uh, good evening. I'm Tim Duggan. I have uh, two children in Montpelier. One's a second grader, has been NCC since kindergarten, uh, loves it. And I have a, a daughter who will be in kindergarten next year. Hopefully we'll join him in CC as well. Uh, just wanted to express my support, my family's support for CC, for everything everyone's done uh, to care for our children. And um, also just at, sort of express a, uh, the same question I've heard before, but a question about where we are in the process. Um, I think uh, we've heard a lot of people uh, who want to be in solutions mode. It sounds like CC has a lot to offer in terms of solutions. And one thing that we hadn't heard tonight that I am curious to hear about is how uh, the problems that were articulated are solved by uh, any other provider, such as part two or, uh, or, or any other provider that might come in. Um, I think we all agree that there are challenges we're facing, but uh, I think the different providers can provide uh, solutions and, and we really haven't heard about them yet. So I, I'd hope we have a chance to listen, learn, and weigh in before decisions are made. Very intimidating in all these cases. Um, I'm Ronnie Lynn Shroud. I have three kids in middle school and one to be in elementary soon. Um, I also ran the Girl Scout troop, and I was unable to continue because of all the outcries of kids wanting to come into the troop um, and lack of help from the volunteers. Um, my question is, is uh, why part two? Why did you choose part two as the provider? They don't give much information, and there's a lack of transparency there with them. Um, and are you going to give other providers an opportunity to step up to come into our community or in our community to want to step in and use that? Um, I haven't been able to use Community Connections because of the huge wait list, um, but I've been lucky enough to be home with my children, so I haven't had to use that. Um, so if we can, build upon community connection instead of bringing in that other provider I think would be better than bringing in new people maybe add something to community um, someone more it sounds like it's more in the elementary than the middle school but um, if we can find someone to add to them instead of bring in is what I want to see to them Well, we're, we're going to discuss process. Uh, in this process, it's actually not a requirement, um, but we are going to. Jill, do you want to talk? Really quick. Okay, go for it. <laughs> Hi, I'm Jill Remick. I have a daughter who has gone through Union and is now at the middle school. And I think, um, I think, as Peter pointed out, there's a lot of us here who sort of want to help you guys figure out a bigger picture solution because what the common theme is there's this not going away anytime soon window of time where our kids need and, and want um, activity and extracurricular activities. So if there is some way that some of us could help, you know, have the rec department conversations and the after school program and the sporting, you know, there's, there's different pieces that our kids all sort of participate in in that window of time. So it's, it's more than just this one 
narrow piece. So Libby, I love what you said when you said we want to talk about how to grow and expand it because we absolutely need to reach those families that need it. And I'm definitely guilty of being the Drew. Ah, we gotta get it like turning it right around because Drew's amazing. My first thought when I heard about this was the the school district should just hire Drew and just have him create this magical Montpelier after school <laughs> community because we're all here and the demand is here. So that's a good problem to have. Um, so yeah, if there are any things that we parents can help talk about to bring the rec department into this or the athletics division into this to try to talk that through, we're, we're here. Okay, sure. thank you. So, so to answer your question, um, no, there's not a requirement to need an RFP. I think what you know, the board has to deliberate and decide, uh, and I think what you're hearing from both Alex and Libby, and I think the sentiment of the crowd. Well, first of all, I want to say I think there's a lot of commonality in terms of goals and visions and what we want. Uh, I, I heard that from everyone who presented. Um, the need to expand opportunities, quality opportunities, the type of opportunities that represent our community values. Um, I, th I think what the board is going to deliberate on is what, what does give guidance to what that process is looking forward so we can put something in place for next year uh, that build on all the great assets we have. Well, I'm actually unclear what the board's role is. Well, we're going to talk about that. Okay, because yeah. I, 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 I want to, I feel like we're, we're in a position here where we're having a board meeting about this, but we don't actually, the board has not had a role up to this point. Yeah. So we want to figure out, I would like to have a conversation about yeah. the definition of the administration versus the board's role on this. We don't have to do it right this second, but I think before we take any action. Well, let's, let's deal with any of the questions that we feel she can knock off and some of the questions were directed to the board, and some of the questions were just, we're going to have to wrestle with. Um, okay. So I wrote down, what did I write down? Um, questions about questions I've heard, and I'm going to kind of lump them together as much as I possibly can, because some connected. Um, some quick ones that I can answer. There has been no contract signed whatsoever. So naming part two as the next provider was part of the mistakes I made. Um, so there are no contracts signed with them. Um, and if the board so wishes, I can go into more of an RFP process and put out, these are what the school district needs, who can come help us with our needs um, if the board so wants us to do that. So um, as far as part two, that for me at this moment um, has been sidelined because my suspect my, su would, my suspicion would be that the board is going to ask me to do that and we'll, we'll go ahead and do that um, and in addition to that process knowing this board the way I do I can imagine they will be asking for some parent <coughs> volunteers to be a part of that um, advisory role to so play a role, part in that advisory role so that kind of works out a few different parts of these questions um, in terms of parent involvement as well as part two in, in particular um, and process. Uh, let's see here. <coughs> I think um, I appreciate Jason, you saying, and a few others, how do we engage students? As a middle school teacher, you said you're a middle school teacher, so you know the importance of that, particularly for this age group. Um, I would imagine that any, any provider we go with to provide the child care option piece um, of a plan going forward would absolutely be asking the, the students, particularly at that age level. I'd expect that to happen um, and ensure it happens. And I know that um, the extended day opportunity, which I'm separating those two pieces out between the routine daily three to five as Sarah was talking about child care option and the extended day option um, which is what I, I like to think of as the outdoor enrichments and, and the things that are currently be, being provided those also would engage students as to what what do you want to do during that time um, with some with some control around that it's active it's you know we're, we're out and moving we're outside we're doing things um, so yes absolutely that we know the importance of that, and that would be an absolute um, expectation. Um, in terms of options, that goes back to what I imagine the board is going to ask me to do. Um, in my meetings with CC before, um, or this fall, um, with Alex in particular, 
I, I, we talked about capacity issues. I did not push him hard on capacity issues, and Alex and I have talked about that, and, and I recognize that, yeah, I probably should have pushed you a little harder on that piece. Um, we had a long conversation about that on Monday in particular. Um, and, and I could have done that better. I could have done that piece better so that he knew where we were in this process in a different way. So um, Alex and I did talk about that, and I apologize for that to him. Um, so I could have done that better in that process. It's one of the places that I'm learning um, in this decision-making piece. So um, we did talk about capacity a bit. Um, at the times we talked, I don't want to speak for Alex in any way, shape, or form, but he is a very busy man running an after school for eight different school buildings, and, he, and it was that we, he told me we didn't have capacity um, to increase at that point in time. And Alex, I don't want to put words in your mouth, okay. so by all means, speak up <laughs> if you think I'm, I am. Um, so that was pretty clear to me. Um, and capacity, again, is one piece of this issue. Liability is another piece. Um, and so when, when thinking about could we di divorce from Washington Central, that's central right now to community connections as it is. Um, it's a central piece to it. So uh, going forward, I think that, that whatever the entity is that CC becomes, that's a major piece. Right, Alex? It's, yep. it's a major piece. And I would just say things are complicated at Washington Central as well. Right, right. This isn't just us. Yeah. <laughs> Not just here. Yeah. That's complicated too. That. Yeah. Yeah. So it's bigger. It's bigger piece than capacity um, that that Alex and I are now currently trying to work through and figure out. Um, I'd also like to just reiterate that uh, we had a great conversation on Monday. We're really excited about what we can do together going forward. Um, and I think both of us have some have a common value in what we want to do for kids. It's just how do we move forward getting it to happen. Um, Alex, do you want to say anything more about that no, piece? I, I don't want to put words in your mouth I, or, I, or I, promise your, your future. <laughs> I think we have the same values yeah. and, and goals. Yeah. So the question is how do we, how do we accomplish them? And is CC a part of that or not? Well, it be seen, but I do think we have comfortable for the community and for the kids. Yeah. So I'm going to put some parameters around the board discussion so we can do it I think productively and somewhat efficiently because we still have grants presentation. This is very important. Uh, I think we need a, it's a discussion on the board role. I'm going to give my kind of thoughts on the board role. I think the board has a strong consulting role in this. I think we should give guidance as to how we want the process to play out. Uh, I think this this is ultimately a superintendent decision with consultation from the board. Um, I want to keep it that way. Uh, but I think we should set some parameters for how we want the process to look. Uh, I, th I think we should um, recommend, encourage a RFP process uh, that I think has two main components. One I think is Libby and Alex continuing to work together and to uh, figure out how to work through some structural issues. Uh, and what other pieces need to be brought in to, uh, you know, fulfill the vision that's been laid out and, and to, you know, carry forward the values we want. Uh, and I think there should be an advisory committee that involves parents, uh, board members, um, students, um, and some staff members uh, to to work with, with Libby and putting together, um, you know, a recommendation for her decision that you know she would come to the board and uh, get our, our ultimate uh, you know, guidance on. So that's those are my thoughts, and now I'll open it up the floor. Michelle. Yeah. Um, so one theme that I heard a little bit from the parents is a a perception that part of our capacity problem is that we are underfunding our after school. Can you talk to us about how after school works in other districts? Yeah, um, for districts who do not receive, I almost want to, who's the person who works for the after, Vermont after school? They might be a better person to answer more than I do, so please speak up. <laughs> um, but it's my understanding that, that school districts that have 21C grant funding money 
have a higher poverty rate and generally the school district supports the after school so um, they, they get federal funding to pay for their after school program and in addition there's typically a position with that lot school districts who are in that position have an after school coordinator you know whose job it is to run the after school programming the district I am coming from has an after school coordinator also funded by the federal grant yeah yeah um, in part in part but school districts pay towards that as well um, I don't know of many other school districts and correct me on this one if you know more than I do who put money towards after school programming if it's not from their budget right if it's not better under the 21C but do you know more I, on that? I can do a, some research on it um, and it and it's it gets a little complicated because of different sizes yeah and, um, yeah and poverty rates some of them are um, nonprofit the Greater Burlington YMCA is a, a, a large after-school yep. and summer program provider um, throughout Greater Burlington and um, in Washington County actually um, but it, it would involve a little bit of research but yeah. it's something that we can do right from our organization happy to help they probably have a better way of getting it than I do <laughs> and quicker is that like for like programs such as like reach and yes. things like that yes that. so would our community be eligible for like a reach program our our community is not eligible for federal funding via the 21st century community learning center grants or 21c because that is a threshold of 40 percent um poverty free and reduced lunch rate or higher um, Wasbury is. Wasbury is. Mm -hmm. So, so Wasbury would have to be combined. So, so Libby. Maybe. Okay. Maybe. Yes. Okay. <laughs> are there districts, uh, are the districts, since they don't get funding, that do have after school programs, then it's paid for by the parents? Yes. Right. So yes. the the amount you pay would keep the company in yes. the district. Yes. Yes. It's okay. Is there hand up or you just. Um, so I guess I want to get back to this issue of defining roles because I think that a consultative role is a very squishy thing and I'm concerned um, for instance in the uh, the needs that the district laid out I, there's some things missing that that I think reflect the community values that I think should be in any RFP um, for instance I believe community connections plays a livable wage would that be in the RFP? Um, for instance, um, the retention of existing staff at all levels. Um, uh, I saw what I think, and I, this is the first time I've, I've seen you explain it, is are, are we actually talking about defunding community connections further? I saw 30 some thousand that would cease to be in there, and then it comes out of out of grant or out of uh, scholarships from the provider. There was something in there about scholarships from the provider. Yeah, you're, so one way that school districts reduce costs from alternative providers is that in lieu of rent, right? Because essentially a business is using our buildings, and we would charge them rent. So in lieu of rent, they either give scholarships for students who need, or they create a sliding scale based on how much they would typically pay the public parental. So that's separate. Um, we haven't touched the, the money budgeted for after school programming in our budget. You don't see it as a separate line item, Steve, because it's part of, under the new chart of accounts, it's in the um, co-curricular. Co okay, I think maybe that's what I was seeing is a shift. I, I, there was definitely something on a slide Sorry, I'm missing it now about that money moving. I, I kept that money so that we could keep the Main Street Middle School programming it. What about, is uh, elementary per completely self-funded? Yes. Okay, all right. And then there's a history, so I'll, I'll stop. I just wanted to make sure, I, I think my concern is, is that an RFP can effectively limit applicants proposals by how how high that we set the bar or by what we expect of folks and I I wonder if the board has a role in establishing the RFP or whether you know it just I'm, I'm here sitting here in a, in a public meeting and I have nothing to do with this process and I want to figure out what my role is is really what it is so I'd like that very clearly defined a consultative means something but it doesn't mean a lot and ultimately if the board objects, do we 
do we have a say or do we wait till your evaluation in a year and then you know say thank you for making that decision on behalf of the district I just don't understand that rule and I, I'm, I'm sure that's a conversation you would make you would have a collaborative conversation about that before you might establish that but I know that out of the blocks it were you were assuming that this is just something you could just do and I just want to be careful about not making missteps around authority going forward I might make an uh, assumption probably incorrectly if there was a committee form to work on this and there were a board member or two on that committee that it would be their responsibility to keep the board abreast to how it's going and express the board's uh, concern to that committee that would be my understanding too. I mean, the question is, do we want? I, I, I also think we need a question on, on timing because we have to. Uh, I'm sure, Alice, we, we have to get certain things in place at certain times to have this work. Right. Um, is there time? I had that question. Is there time for an RFP and a, a committee and an RFP and a committee? I think there is, but I think it's it's going to be quick and, and the people who uh, are going to commit to it are going to have to commit to it and expect to have some probably 10 weeks. <laughs> so why did you choose to do it now? Why not in the beginning of the school year? I didn't know. I was com coming in as a new administrator. We all know this is a yeah. problem. Two years passed. Yeah. So, so just just point of order, we're not taking questions from the crowd, but Sorry, I mean, yeah. I, mean I, I think the answer on timing is, you know, there are a lot of things moving, and yeah, I, I think probably you would admit that the, the process mm -hmm. well, got ahead of you a little. Decisions, why not wait till next year? <laughs> so, we're hoping to have, what, what you're hoping for, it sounds like, Libby, is at the beginning of next school year to have in place both the middle school and high school programs that exist now somehow yeah. with the funding that we have for them already mm -hmm. and an additional reliable daily child care yes. option through fifth grade at least at least yes. at least well, well we wouldn't well. limit that option at the middle yeah. school yeah. it would be so at the middle school Okay. In addition to, to, but essentially to expand the existing program at UES so it serves more kids and to add a similar program at the middle school to ensure that we have coverage for parents who want it. Yes. Okay. That's your that's your goal that you hope to have in place by yes. next fall. Yes. Okay. Can I can I get Alice's thoughts on time? I would just say that any license provider that you're gonna come through has to go through the licensing process and probably take about two months. So they would do that over the summer. We can't just train. We can't transfer our license. Even if we were to form a new entity, we would have to start over. Three so license, yeah. your goal for a new provider would be three stars on the first day so you can serve children who are in specialized care. Um, and we actually have a provisional agreement in there right now. But we'll talk about that later. But your real, your hard and fast time frame for the provider is licensing of site, which is a process done through the Child Development Division. Um, it takes about two months and also finding staff because you need a program director with certain qualifications in place at the beginning of that licensing process to carry the process through. Um, so I would say that would be a major time frame constraint for the provider would be the process of licensing from the site. So would it be possible in the next month um, to decide what the priorities are for this uh, provider? and be able to put out an RFP and then have it a quick turnaround. And meanwhile, you're continuing the conversation with Alex as one of those people, but that doesn't mean that we're, we would choose somebody else, but then we've done the process. You know what I mean? Is that possible? I mean, it sounds like we actually kind of are in agreement about what we want and need. Now we have to figure out how to get it. So, if that's an agreement, it's not something we're going to argue about. It seems like we can write up that list fairly quickly, put out an RFP, continue to talk about it, because we'll apply the RFP. And then um, in a month, if we knew in a month, we could and put out an RFP. Is that timetable doable? It's 
hard for me to say to uh, see the RFP because I don't know what the new structure would look like for CC, you know. Okay. You know, I can, I can assume that you could get some of your guidance for the RFP through the licensing application itself. I mean, there's a long 12 page application <laughs> that you have to develop for licensing. So, you, you know, that has certain requirements around like lead paint and things like that, you know, that are minor. But, um, you know, obviously they would have to be licensed as a three star provider. There's no reason not to do it. I think that what you would do at Union would be pretty similar no matter who was coming in to do it. Any provider in Main Street Middle School is a little trickier. It's never been licensed. Um, you know, you may run into some issues with space there. But I don't know that. You know, that I think Union is a much more of a kind of, I would say, commodity, but there's a lot of programs like in the state. What you were talking about at Main Street is more unusual. I mean, this, the stuff we do at Main Street, we did our committee, we're the only program like it in the whole state. There's nobody else that. Runs a, you know, runs a program like what we run at Main Street Middle School that's not funded by federal or state at the prices mm -hmm. rate. Mm -hmm. um, I'd be happy to help out with that process. You know. So, does the board have to take an action tonight, or do we just have to, in a more general way, endorse a process that you've, you've laid out, which is a process that involves a community involvement and the superintendent's ongoing work and our process. I don't, I don't, do it, is there an action for the board? Or I don't is think it we just I don't think <laughs> take an action. I, I, I mean, I think we should at least get verbal agreement. That's where we want to go. Well, it sounds okay. like there's a question as to whether the board wants to charge a committee or not. Well, I have, I have a larger question, actually. So we're talking about an RFP as though it's an isolation. But to me, this seems like a bit of a systemic issue. This process could have occurred on any number of issues that were important to our community. And so I wonder if, and it's not a decision for tonight, but I do wonder if we need to consider a more system-wide approach where we encourage a more competitive and more community-involved process when we approach these issues. Because this isn't the only time that we're going to have an issue like this. And you could re-engage it through your policy. Right, right. right. And there is a policy that you yeah. could look at that's called budget execution. So there, it is in policy. If you want to adjust it, you could adjust it through policy. But I think that's my concern, too, is that the policies aren't clear about this, or perhaps they limit us. And so I just, I'm not advocating that we don't participate. I'm advocating that, we, that we're very clear what our goal is, um, short of having a clear policy on this. I think it's always obviously our role is a little squishy. I mean, there are, I mean, I, I think from a structural standpoint, this is you know, clearly an administrative decision, but at the end, there's these spaces where obviously, you know, this touches the community hugely, and, you know, the community wants a voice, and our role as a board is to, to help with that. So, um, you know, it's the reason we're having, having this, this meeting, and, you know, the reason that, that people reach out to us. So, um, I, was, I think I can live with a little squishiness in role. It seems yes. like it's the timing is urgent. The timing is urgent. Yes. There's clearly a need to make sure we have something in place next year that meets that needs of access and equity for kids. But that, that's not something that can be delayed a year. Um, so <coughs> yes. uh, the discussion that about roles and uh, the next time this happens is a bigger discussion that will take more time yeah. that we don't really have time for in order to get this process. No, you don't. And to be honest ground. with you, I think it's going to be yeah. a hard thing to nail down where those lines. Yeah. Exactly. And this is an unusual issue, this issue where there's yes. a major service being provided to our kids through, through a, a very through odd vendor. structure. I mean, you know, that we don't do a lot of that in the district yes. mostly we provide the services directly. Um, so it's a little mm -hmm. bit sui generis. And Thanks. Good yeah. lawyer talk. Good lawyer talk. <laughs> <laughs> unique, unique, Bridget. Good lawyer talk. I would just say I like I like what you're laying out, and I think we should do that. What the other piece that community members advocate or mentioned is this issue of regionality or um, a regional approach to a problem right from the beginning historically, and I'm wondering what we're effectively advocating for here is that we stop regional collaboration and we go our own way. Perhaps that's de facto that there's no choice, that the region has fallen apart over a period of time, um, both for initially from a funding fail, or funding, end of funding, but also just from the fact that no one seems to, at Washington Central anyway, doesn't seem to be 
engaged in this process. And I don't know if Washington Central is engaged in it, but I've not heard that it is. And so I wonder whether this issue of uh, robust, stable programs is important enough that we need to have some volume, some numbers to make that work, or whether that's not important to continue this program on any kind of a cost-effective way. And if it is, then shouldn't we be requiring this to be a regional approach? But if the numbers, because it's being regional, were there, we wouldn't have this problem now. So uh, is that the reason? I don't know. I'm just wondering whether are we have we given up on the idea of working as Central Vermont and we're now just working as Montpelier and Roxbury. That's a big historic political movement change from where this community was. So maybe the question is, what's more important? Do yeah. you have uh, a regional com combination or have all of the people that need and want access to repair get yeah. Well, I don't think we need to this decision. Absolutely yeah. not, but I mean, there will be a point at which the decision has to be made. I mean, the counterpoint to regional collaboration is the district having more control of its own office. Yeah, yes. definitely. It's important. Yeah. And it's been a problem, it seems. And we've merged into a new district with another district. So we now have a region of our district which will be further away from Washington Central. And well, Washington Central is working on a lot of stuff. And they're working on <laughs> <laughs> So where, where are we at? So I would have to go back. I, I, I think, you know, an RFP, um, you know, Alex and Libby are already talking and I think, you know, really thinking hard about next steps. and. You know, encouraging that. Uh, I think the question is, do we want some sort of advisory committee? I would say yes, but I would also like to, you know, whoever's on that, you know, the expectations that it would be an advisory committee. That's what committee. they're doing for the next month. And it's intensive. It's not going to be all, all that left, at least for the next few weeks. You know, probably you know, spending some time with both Alex and Libby really learning what the the options are, um, and coming back with you know recommendation, make sure we have uh, you know an option in place that is um, going to serve our kids well and build on the good stuff we have, and you know point to some stability and growth and uh, you know growth of our values in this yeah you know, this very important aspect of I think uh, you know, the school district. So that's that's where I'm at. Do we need I, a do we need a is, is this well, something we need a formal board committee charge for, or mm -hmm. could we just have? I think if we're, if we're forming a committee, we should probably charge a committee. Okay, let's start with committee. Remember. Right. So, so I would move that we charge an advisory committee, uh, create an advisory committee charged to work with the superintendent on the actual programming. I second. Second. Do we need to set uh, composition? Mm -hmm. Yes, we need to. I mean, I suggest composition, duration, all basic. Uh, uh, Charge. So we need a certain number of um, school board members. I say two board uh, members, two parents, two students, two staff. Okay. Two board members, two parents. Two students, two staff slash administrator. Um, how about one teacher, one administrator? No, no, I meant you're talking about staff of the Montpelier Roxbury School System? Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Okay. Okay. And to serve um, until the end of the, the end of the process. Until the end of the process. Is there a report back? What's the product? Are they reporting back to us, or are they moving on without any further board consultation? Uh, I would. I, I don't. So yeah, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know that we need clear. a form. I mean, the board can always amend the charge if we feel like we need a formal report. Yeah. Okay. Right. And if our yeah. expectations, the board members will report back. Yeah, I think the, the, right. yeah, the board members can report back, and if we need something more, we can. We can direct them. We can direct it. We get a second. Yeah. We do. Becky, second. Becky. All those in favor? Uh -huh. Aye. Aye. Any opposed? 
Great, thank you. Uh, community members, um, <laughs> email me if you're interested. Uh, should we just pick, try to see if we can get board members now? I'm happy to do it. I'm happy to defer. Oh, I would do. I'm sorry. Board members, I'll do it. Just <laughs> sharing. <laughs> okay. Um, Sorry, I'm busy with negotiations. Okay. <laughs> uh, in terms of students, you want to work with, with Mike and students. Mm -hmm. Mike and Ben. I think yep. probably want to be the answer. Um, all right. Yeah, and it's Jim Murphy at mpsvt.org, but I please do it do it quickly. I would love. Are you volunteer? No. to keep the numbers a little bit smaller just to yeah. be able to get it off the ground and meeting we can also invite elementary students to come yeah to I a think meeting we without necessarily having you know yeah. an elementary student yeah so. the, trick is that the trickiest thing about a committee that's going to meet often and soon is, is to get everybody in the room so <laughs> yes. that'll be hard time yeah. yeah yeah and we can definitely you know do outreach and Okay, great. So please do email me. I'll I'll set out some social media to soliciting. Uh, yeah, it, yeah, it's going to be time intensive, but uh, I think it'll be rewarding. It's going to be a, a yeah a good process, and it's it's obviously important for the district. So um, yeah, it's, it's got some time over the next month, um, or are willing to make time. Uh, hugely appreciated. Um, I don't think we voted together. Or we did vote. We did vote. <laughs> Yes. I first of all want to thank everyone for coming out um, and for caring about this issue because it's very important. So thank you. I also want to thank Libby um, and the entire administrative team for the work that's gone into thinking about this issue and for making sure that um, that we're meeting the needs of all the kids in the district. So thank you. And I want to and second I want to that. Alex. I want to second that because you know Bridget took this on herself a couple of years ago in making sure this became a priority for the for the district and at that time. The administration did not adopt it as a priority, and now now it is. And so that's a really important step for our district is that this is elevated to be one of our highest priorities. It was falling on, I honestly believe it's falling on deaf ears before, and the board wasn't able to move it forward the way it wanted to. So having you, Libby, and your team make this a priority is a huge thing for our district. So thank you. Yeah, no, no, I want to echo all of that. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Uh, Grant is up next <laughs> for the scintillating budget presentation. I uh, appreciate all the conversation that has occurred and that some of that might need to continue. And if you could continue that in the hallway, if it's not related to the budget, that would be awesome. For those of you who are sticking around for the budget presentation, I appreciate your time and your patience. Um, obviously, I'm going to try to get through this very quickly because we're already beyond the scheduled time for the board meeting. So um, this is, I think, the third time we've gone through the presentation uh, with the board. Um, and my clicker doesn't work. Did you do the Yeah, I got it. I apologize. No, you're fine. So just to go over what we're going to talk about, we're going to go over some district information, some context. Um, some things that have changed, enrollment and staffing. We'll look at the budget, both the general fund and the capital fund. We'll talk about tax rates, which as the slide says, are not final yet because there's still some missing pieces. And we'll look at uh, a little bit of an outlook going into some future years. So for the overview. Here's our district overview. So just in case anybody doesn't know, we have Rockford Village School. It's pre-K to four, grade four. And, and right now it has 44 students. Enrolled Union is pre-K to four and has 432 students enrolled. Main Street is obviously grades five through eight um, and has 365 students enrolled. And currently, Roxbury Village students uh, attend Main Street as well. And Montpelier High School is grades nine through 12 and has, <laughs> only has 302 students enrolled. And for personnel, we have 240 employees. 225 of them are full-time equivalency and 142 teachers. And when we get them all in this room, it is packed 
solid. <laughs> we try to do that at least once a month. And that skull that was on the bottom left is Roxbury. If you haven't seen it, it's very cute. It is. Um, so, uh, so for some context, I don't know if this was my or yours or that, I'll take it. Um, we were asked to put together a slide to basically explain the education funding for, uh, system, which um, that's impossible. But, <laughs> but what we did do is we found this, this YouTube video, which I encourage you to look at. It's, it kind of reminds me of uh, the old Schoolhouse Rocks, except it's not as musical. Um, it's like a cartoon that goes through the whole process of the Vermont education funding formula. Um, it's very good. It's about 11 minutes long, and that's the link. But I have to, watched it now five times, and I still probably don't understand it all, but I'm closer because <laughs> of the video. But just some quick things, where the money comes from. So the education fund is a separate fund, and the money that goes into that, part of it comes from the general, the state's general fund that gets transferred. Part is sales and use tax. Part is um, the lottery proceeds. Um, about 41% of it is non-residential taxes, so businesses and rentals, that kind of thing. The rest, about a quarter of it, is property taxes, which is kind of surprisingly low, that only a quarter of the education fund comes from property taxes. Um, of those, the only one that the budget really directly impacts is property taxes. And then, once you start looking at property taxes, um, a lot of the most critical factors that, that come into that calculation, we don't really have a whole lot of control over, like common level of appraisal, which is based on property values. Um, and then to give you some context, a 1% change in the CLA um, increases or decreases the tax rate by almost two cents. Um, we don't have any say in the statewide dollar yield that every school district is compared to. Um, and a hundred dollar change in that dollar yield, which you'll see later, impacts the tax rate by over a penny and a half. Um, equalized pupil count, I mean, you could say we kind of have something to do with that because I think we provide services that make people want to move into this, this community, um, but you don't have total control over equalized pupils. And if you have an increase of 10 students or a decrease of 10 students, it impacts your tax rate by 1.4 cents. The thing that's interesting is we could add $100,000 to the budget and it's only going to change the tax rate by less than a cent. So you can see there's a lot of things that we, ha that we don't have control over whenever you see the tax rates. Uh, and we'll actually show that calculation in a little bit. So statewide, I mentioned the statewide dollar yield. It depends on the health of the education fund. Uh, and it also depends on what education spending is looking like. So we're fortunate this year that the education fund doesn't have a hole that has to be filled. Um, we're also fairly fortunate that ed spending as a state is projected to go up 3.24%, which isn't huge. Ours is a little bit more than that, but then again, as Libby mentioned, we're one of the few places that has increasing enrollment. Um, Fortunately, the dollar yield is expected to increase in FY20, which means the tax rate is decreased. Um, local spending gets divided by that number to come up with a tax rate. Um, on the flip side, unfortunately, the CLA is dropping in our communities. Um, it's kind of good news and bad news. The good news is your properties are worth more money. The bad news is the tax rate goes up as a result of that. Um, Statewide, property values are supposed to increase about 2.5%. In Montpelier, they're up about 2.64. And in Roxbury, um, they're up about 5.9%. Um, part of that is because Roxbury recently reappraised. And I'm not sure what's driving the rest of it. I mean, it could be that there's... They have an excellent school system now. They, well, they, they, had, a, they had an excellent school before, but, um, but this CLA, that last bullet, if I used last year's CLA, this year, the tax rate in Roxbury goes down almost 10 cents. So just because of the CLA drop of, of um, 5.86, it swings at 9.7 cents. Um, another kind of statewide factor that's not directly related to the formula is health insurance. So statewide health insurance premiums are up almost 12%. And health premium costs are over $2 million of our budget. So it's a big piece. Um, 
The good news is <laughs> there's something called a clawback where the state realized we went to high deductible plans and that was going to cost less money. So they did us all a favor and took money from us. Um, so they didn't give us all the revenue they were supposed to because they, and they knew that we were going to save some money. Um, we don't have that clawback in FY20. They took money away from us in 18. They took money away in 19, 65,000. In FY20, they're not going to do that anymore. It's in statute. So we don't have to worry about that. Um, the other good thing is we have health reimbursement accounts for our, stu our uh, staff, and we're going to assume that people aren't going to use all of that money. So that helps fill some of that void, too. So some of our context, um, as I said earlier, one of the pieces that leadership has been doing this school year is really evaluating where we are in terms of structures and systems and which of those are really solid and which of those do we need to grow um, and build our capacity. So you're not gonna see many frills in this budget um, simply because we're still in that, in that evaluation mode. We've noticed some major um, ideas that stuck out to us and you do see those represented in this budget, but it's really how do we take stock of where we are and build systems and structures so we can grow in the future and build our capacity in the future. Some more systems perspective. So this current fiscal year was big. Um, we had a merger that we were working out. We had several projects that were started and finished, um, and some not started, or some not finished. Um, and we had a significant turnover in administration. Myself, taking on the new role, as well as Ryan Harity at UES, taking on the new principalship role. Um, two administrators in one year is pretty big for a school system, as small as ours. Um, I'm sorry? Oh, we also have my grade. Thank you. Facilities. Oh, and facilities. Oh, you're right. Sorry. I just think of Brian and I is the most important, obviously. Uh, so we have. Um, look at Andrew. Andrew's getting up. Um, so we have some capacity building that we've noticed we need to do. Um, we want to establish structures so that in the future we can develop things in a way that works and um, is not just laying things on teachers and our staff, but it's doing things in a very progressive way that works for us. And we want to ensure equitable services for all students. That is most definitely a theme from the board as well as uh, from our district leadership. With the merger, we were asked just to speak to this briefly. With this merger, there were definitely some bumps in the road we, that we couldn't have imagined prior without actually going through the merger process. Um, we weathered those pretty well and the transition has gone pretty well. Um, from my perspective, I have nothing to compare it to. However, I think that it's gone well. Uh, our tax incentive, because of that merger, goes from eight cents to six cents in fiscal year uh, 20, which of course is actually a 2% increase for us. Um, so uh, the amazing financial planning from that, this past year helps us, and Grant's gonna speak to that later um, and what he was thinking about. In terms of factors, we have an increased enrollment and we have minimal staffing increases for this fiscal year, um, despite the increased enrollment. We have this coming, this year is the first year of paying back the bond principal for the playground work and the work that is about to start here at the high school um, in particular. We had one time fiscal year 19 pay projects. That's what's helping us stay relatively even from the 2% increased tax rate because fiscal year 19, uh, the team before me planned on one-time project costs that are now eliminated from our budget. Um, that was pretty smart fiscal planning, financial planning on the team's part that I can't take credit for. Um, and we also are, are having, going forward, reduced tuition costs. So students who were grandfathered into school choice from the Roxbury-Montpelier uh, merger, that number is, is getting smaller each year. So we have reduced tuition costs there which will fact factors into um, the overall budget. In terms of things that we've noticed that we'd like to hit upon in this budget, uh, there is a theme in the community around adding busing for Main Street Middle School students. Um, so you'll see that represented in the, bu in the uh, budget. In terms of capacity building, this budget hits on the idea of world language immersion, a study for programs to move forward, not actually putting programs in place, but a study to provide us with the baseline capacity to move forward with that idea. Uh, we have a need for a social emotional learning coordinator. 
um, that really helps us build capacity in the future with our, with our kids who are the most challenging kids in terms of school and what they bring with them um, to school. So that position is meant to build our capacity in the future years of our programming and systems of how we support kids with really challenging needs. Um, and of course, equity, which is, which is something that we've talked about a lot tonight. Um, we also see some additional support for our food services providers in this budget, uh, increasing management positions at UES and, and Main Street um, in order to provide, one, a more equitable wage for those, but also to increase our capacity to build better food programs for our kids. Um, so that's represented in this budget. In regards to the bond, the UES playground work has begun. Um, most of the heavy, I'm looking at Andrew so I don't say anything wrong, most of the heavy lifting or the earth, the rough earthwork is completed. There's still a bit more. And um, if you're a UES parent, we saw today in Ryan's swoop scoop that um, they've able to, the contractor has been able to work longer in January than they expect, into January, they didn't expect necessarily to do that because of the warmer temperatures. Is that correct, Andrew? Um, and uh, it's scheduled to be completed by, by the beginning of school next fall. Um, so they will eventually take a break, the construction crews, because of weather, and then come back when the weather allows them to. Uh, the UES vestibule is nearly complete. <laughs> um, so it will be done late February, early March. Yep, so it's, work, it's moving forward. Um, and other projects that we are, we are going out to bid in mid-January for that we've had lots of conversations right before break around uh, was particularly the, the Montpelier High School Auditorium and Fitness Wing and making sure those plans are the way that we want them and the UI, UES elevator and bathrooms which were part of the bond work. Um, th those bids will go out shortly. Mid-January, still Andrew? Same package as well as the uh, projects below. Okay. And then other projects to be bid in January, again, Andrew just said in the same, in the same prop um, package for costs, so we can try to keep costs down as much as possible. We have Main Street Middle School bathrooms that are getting renovated. Um, and they, those will be unisex bathrooms over by the gym area. Um, and the remaining high school roof replacement, the roof over the auditorium that was not done this past summer. That is being bid in January. Okay, it's, as far as unknowns that are still out there, we don't have an equalized pupil count from the Agency of Education. They're having some challenges trying to pull data. Um, we do have an estimate that we're using, and my hope is that it's maybe on the conservative side. I think we're close. Um, the dollar yield and non-residential tax rate are as good as they're going to get, but they aren't official because they have to be set by law. Um, career center six semester average, that's for tech tuition. We don't have that yet, and that will impact revenues and expenses, but not in a significant way at all. Um, changes, and what I mean by changes is these are changes that occurred since the last time we met in, I think, December 19th. So we got final CLA numbers, and we were off by 0.33% by in Montpelier, so we were guessing pretty close for Montpelier, but we were off by a pretty significant amount in Roxbury. Um, so we plugged in these new CLA factors and you'll see how that um, gets factored into the tax rate calculations later. You're gonna hear everybody talk about it a lot, equalized pupils, it's the biggest unknown that I have right now. We did change it since the last time we met. I bumped it up to be level with FY19. It, we had been using a number that was a little lower. I think that we're safe saying it's going to at least stay level. My hope is that it'll go, it will go up. Um, we have more kids, but unfortunately that's not the only thing that's factored into equalized pupils. It's a two-year average. It's weighted for English language learners, um, poverty factors. There's a lot that goes into it, so you're never really sure how that's going to come out. Um, on the expense side, we had a real minor change based on some dues that we got a new estimate on. Um, on the revenue side, we increased tuition because we were just assuming that the kids that were here are going to come back, but chances are we're going to at least pick up one more kid. So we did decide not to be ultra conservative and assume we're going to get at least one new kid. Um, balance forward is really 
using fund balance as a revenue source, which you can do in a budget. I had been using it as a revenue source. We decided to take it out, so it's showing that we decreased fund balance by 87,500 as a revenue source. Um, if we put it in, it helps this year's tax rate. But whenever we take it out next year, it would create a bigger hole to fill, and we're already having to deal with that two cent tax rate that's gonna be bumped up next year. So for now, we've taken it out. If need be, we can put it back in later. So this chart is just a quick preview that compares FY18 through FY20. Um, the total budget is up about 2.7%, much less than last year. Um, Non-tax revenues is actually less, so that kind of hurts a little bit, but not really, because the main reason why it's down is because we get special ed revenues based on our expenses. Our expenses happen to be lower in special ed, which means our revenues are probably going to be lower as well. Um, education spending is about a 4% increase, which is less of an increase than last year. Um, equalized pupils, as I said, is hopefully a conservative number. Um, and then ed spending per pupil is really dependent on what that pupil count is, but for right now we're showing a 4% increase from last year. Um, we're almost $2,000 below the excess spending penalty threshold, so we're still in good shape there. We did institute a capital plan last year, or actually FY19 at $250,000. We're proposing to have a capital plan of $260,000 for FY20, and it'll be a separate article and a separate fund. So now we'll look real briefly at enrollment and staffing. Um, you'll notice on this chart, or you may not notice, but um, K through four does not include Roxbury Village School. If we put them, th those kids in here, it would really skew our class size analysis because there's so few kids there. So K-4 does not include Roxbury. Six through 12 does include Roxbury students as they transition into Main Street and Montpelier High School. Um, kindergarten is circled because you'll see starting in FY21, the numbers look kind of low. That's based on birth data from four, four years ago. So, you know, I'm hoping those numbers are actually going to be higher, but that's, it is what it is. Um, even with those kindergarten numbers potentially lower than they really are, um, our K through 12 numbers that are circled, you see we're going up to um, 1136 next year, which is 64 new kids, and up to 1212 in uh, FY23. So if you look at that period of time, you're talking about an increase of about 140 kids. Now, some of those kids are Roxbury kids that are transitioning in. I mean, maybe 50 of those. So you're still looking at at least 100 new kids into the community. It, it could be that um, the, the the model shows it going trending like that because it, the model's based on historical. So we would probably, I mean, I, I guess I would probably want to talk to Mike McCray right. to find right. out, you know, if, if there's a reason that he can think of. Um, it's not a dramatic uh, change in a lot of years. I mean, like 69 to 65, 60 to 58, um, but it does drop somewhat. Well, look at my, my daughter's class, 76 to 62, 14 kids yeah. from last year to this year. Yeah. I don't know that that happens. <laughs> uh, I, think it, I think they're just at early college. Right? Yeah, early college or maybe some dual enrollment. Maybe they're not in school for the majority of the day, so they're not counted as a student. And so, yeah. so we could talk to Mike about that. Um, so even with projected enrollment increases, we don't appear to need to add classroom teachers until FY22. Um, this chart, if, if you see cells in yellow, uh, up above, uh, that means we're within one student of, of the max class size. If it's red, that means we're over class size. So you can see at FY22, we would need to add a classroom teacher in 7-8, um, which would solve the problem in FY23 as well. 
And then in FY23, we'll probably need to add at least some portion of a, a teacher at the high school. That may not be a 1.0. It could be that we need another 0.6 in science or something like that, depending on how the class sizes look. The lower chart is average class sizes. So, you know, not every class size is exactly this. Some classes are going to be higher, and some classes, like AP classes at the higher school, might be lower. So are we, for the maximum class size, how are we determining that? I know that there was a policy that was in place and it was a summary in each of the schools at the time. And so was that rezoned for the movement of the fifth grade too? Like how is that done? The class sizes, so K through three, the class sizes are 15 to 20, I believe. So 20 would be the maximum. 17 is the optimal. That's a policy that was adopted by the, the board. Mm -hmm. That's for Montpelier schools, um, not Roxbury. Um, 4 through 12 is 18 to 25, with a, an optimal number of 22. Sue, so remember that um, all new policies came into effect this year because of the new district. Uh -huh. So any of the policies that you might remember from your good old days when we were talking about class sizes aren't yeah, affected like, anymore. Yeah. Okay. But the policies are online, so you can get to them. So there's new like zoning and new numbers. Yeah, everything's new. Okay. Yeah. So okay. So when was when the classes reach over twenty, those twenty two, then it would be considered needed. No, so for K through three, if the class size, the average class size hits twenty, we would want to bring on another teacher. Yeah, I'm, I'm more it, interested in like five six. <laughs> Five, six is yeah. 18, 18, yeah, to specifically. 18 to 25 is the range, so if we hit 25, we'd want to add a, a teacher. And we are real close. Um, the, the interesting thing there is because we're not a school of you know, 10,000 kids, if you switch from, if you add a teacher, you're going to go from, from um, being right at the edge of, of maximum class size to being like below the window because one more teacher is, is gonna make that much of a dramatic change. But if we go over the maximum class size, we bring on another classroom teacher. So I just wanna just kind of reiterate the like class sizes and how important it is and the experiences that the children that are having lower than optimal class sizes come back to our school systems and say that is the one thing that they remember the most. And so that's why, because I know my guys are in that kind of bubble and I see that being in, they have an impact from that. The other so challenge, that's just remember. and one and one class, one teacher, like I know, like it seems like a huge deal, but on the the effect of that one teacher could be greater than the cost. Yeah, just to acknowledge. Yeah. Anyway, sorry, we're going to point. Slacky and off his chair, okay, but we do have a <laughs> uh, sorry a, a late night window for discussion. Yeah. Um, and questions. So. Um, so the rest of the story, this is Roxbury K through four. Um, so it just shows you, since the other one didn't include Roxbury K through four, this is a snapshot. There's no fancy math here. There's no big model. It's just if there's eight first graders this year, we assume there's going to be eight second graders next year. Um, and the class sizes are obviously different for Roxbury Village School. So on the staffing side, there's not a lot on this chart. We're proposing two increases, one decrease, and a shift from grant funding to local funding. So we are recommending a human resources coordinator. Um, I think you'd be hard pressed to find an organization that has over 200 employees and $24 million that doesn't have an HR coordinator. In fact, you'd be hard pressed to find one that doesn't have an HR department. Mm -hmm. um, so the size of the organization alone is an argument there. Liability concerns are something that, that, that are worrying me, things like the Affordable Care Act, Fair Labor Standards, Family Medical Leave Act, um, health changes all the time. Um, so there's a lot of things that could go wrong and could go dramatically wrong. Um, the bottom line here is that the chart says we just want to make sure that we're taking care of the employees so they can focus on their job and focus on the kids. Um, the custodial decrease of a 0.5, that's not cutting a 0.5. We have a 0.5 that we didn't fill and we think we can survive without it. So there's no sense in funding it. Um, at UES, there's an interventionist coach position. We're not, we don't want to cut it. We think it's a very much needed position. 
The problem is UES won't qualify for title funds next year, so we're shifting it from being funded by federal funds to being funded locally. So it's not an increase in the expense budget, but we're not able to use revenues to cover it. So um, it kind of increases education spending though. Um, the social emotional learning coordinator position would allow us to institute a model to integrate kids back into the classroom and hopefully avoid costly outside placements. Um, the focus would be teaching social and self-regulation self skills. Um, so this is kind of an exciting thing to see if we can build some capacity here as well. Um, really briefly on the shift from title funds, would you mind just briefly explaining that for folks who aren't familiar with why you don't qualify for that? Or what that even means? Yeah. So with title funding, with title one funding, um, <coughs> it's based on poverty rates and when you're in a district with multiple schools of the same level, which we now are, mm -hmm. we weren't previously, we now are, it involves targeting and ranking based on poverty levels. Um, so where union falls in terms of free and reduced lunch numbers, now in the newly merged district, does not qualify them for Title I funds. This year we grandfathered them in because sometimes that change can be unexpected and the feds know that, so they allow you one year of grandfathering. That's what's happening is now, but because they're grandfathered this year, that's like our one get out of jail free card. Next year there there's not a possibility for grandfather. We know they're not gonna they're not gonna be offered Title I funding. And when you say at the same level you mean the same grade span. Yes, yes, thank you, Tina. The same grade span. Yep. And so some of these budgetary pressures, like the shift from the title funds, the federal grant funding we were talking about with after school funding, that in some ways is representative of our socioeconomic yes. status as a community. Yes. And therefore not getting federal assistance that other communities yes. might. So I just think it's important for the yes. public to understand yep. that. All right, so we're going to dig into expenses real quick. Um, this slide just shows the number that we're tracking to, the $24,080,000. Um, this is just a pie chart showing kind of the percentage of money that goes into each of the buckets. I think most of these are pretty much self-explanatory, but um, you know, if you look at general ed, special education, career center tuition, and maybe a piece of the speech, you're looking about 60% of the budget is going toward direct instruction. Um, some of the areas, like buildings and grounds, just so you know, the capital plan, that 260 is part of that. Um, Safety includes our school resource officer, bus aides, um, and crossing guards. The principal and special services would be your principal's budgets at each school and the special, administ uh, special ed administration office here. And fund transfer, we'll talk about that a little bit later. We did touch on it a little bit, Libby did. The fund transfer is purely the money that we have to transfer to food service as an enterprise to help it break even, because it doesn't. Um, so moving on, this is just a quick visual that shows increases and decreases. I'm not going to spend any, any time on here because the next slide goes into the details. And um, career center tuition is highlighted because we don't have a six semester average, which goes into that calculation. I think I'll just point out some of the things. General education is going down, which is refreshing. Um, a lot of that's because of the grandparent of Roxbury tuition. There's less kids because it's one less ki year of kids being to, um, grandparented. Our preschool tuition is going down as well. Um, special ed is only up 1.64. It actually would be a bit of a decrease, but um, next year there's a uni statewide chart of accounts and we have to re-bucket some things. We used to show some costs for triple E, which is essential early education. We used to show it in general ed, it's really a special education requirement. So if it wasn't for that $170,000 shift in between buckets, special education would actually be one down too. Um, let's see, co-curriculars and athletics, that's where we do have money for after school. Are those the items that are being cut, I'm sorry, in the comments, or are those things that are being added? Those are, those are both. Um, general education is decreasing, and it's because there's a decrease in grandparented Roxbury tuition. I'm sorry, there's I meant specifically the co-curriculars athletic one. The co-curricular and athletics, those are things that we added. 
So in co-curricular and athletics, you'd see an increase in this line because we added some advisors for activities like Equity Alliance, Racial Justice, the conversation. But you're going to see that it looks like there's a cut. The reason why that is is because of this statewide chart of accounts. We had busing costs in co-curricular and athletics. You can't put it there. It has to be under transportation, which is down bottom. Awesome. Thank you. So we actually increased the budget, but some of the costs shifted down. Um, student support <laughs> is uh, where we put the money for the social emotional learning coordinator. Um, staff support is where you see the money for the language, world language immersion study. Um, principal's office isn't really increasing that much and it's a little bit uh, of a misnomer because you can have one first person that, that comes in that, that shifts us from a, a single person family cover, uh, coverage to a family coverage for health and that's a swing of like 20 some odd thousand dollars. So when you have one or two of those situations, it can really make it look percentage wise like it's a big increase. Um, business services is a significant increase there because that's where we plugged in the HR coordinator that we're looking for. Um, buildings and grounds is a, a significant decrease because as Libby said, last year we knew we had an eight cent tax incentive. We knew it was gonna drop to six. So we put a significant amount of project funds in FY19, knowing that we were going to cut those back out in 20. A big influx of one-time project money to keep Andrew busy this year, which he is keeping busy. Um, we did cut that back significantly in FY20. We didn't cut it all the way back to where we were, but we did cut it back significantly. And we hopefully will be able to make another reduction next year to help out with that two cent um, tax incentive change. Grant. Would another way of saying that be that we took the tax incentive from the merger and invested it in facilities? Some of it, yes. A good chunk of it. And, and, and it wasn't wasting money. We were pretty right. smart as a group to say, how can we have a, use a, a significant amount of money in the right way and not just toss it away? We don't want to just spend money to spend money. So we took care of some of that deferred maintenance that we were looking at. So we did some good things with that money, um, and this year we're going to do some more good things, but not quite as much as we did this year. Didn't we also pay for the tuition for students in other schools out of that money? I mean, we paid it out of something, so that they, money helped. Part of the budget was, well, the budget was a big budget last yeah. year. <laughs> there were a lot of pluses and a lot of things. Right. But we did have to pay for four years' worth of grandparents of tuition now right. we're only gonna have to pay for three so right. yes um, transportation looks like a huge increase a big piece of that is busing from uh, Main Street Middle School but we also had to move field trips from general education um, athletic trips from co-curriculars and athletics so all those went down into transportation the, the increase that we plugged in is 120,000 for Main Street but realize that we do get transportation aid. It's two years delayed, but in two years, we would get about $48,000 of that 120. So it's really like a long-term net cost of about 72,000. Um, debt service, as Libby mentioned, there's a big increase because this is the first year we had to pay principal on that $4.9 million bond. From here on out, it should be level or decreasing slightly. Fund transfer, isn't a huge number, but percentage-wise it looks huge, and that's because we're adding money in, <coughs> trying to bump up food service salaries to make livable wages there, and also, as Libby mentioned, there are some people that are on the cusp of getting health insurance, and we really should go ahead and give them that extra hour and give them their health insurance. Yeah. <laughs> so next, we'll look at revenues. Boy, it's hard to go through this fast, but I'm going to try. Um, ed spending really just balances revenues with expenses, so that's all that is. Um, tech on behalf, when we have a six semester average, we'll figure that out, but it should be close. The small schools grant is really tied to Roxbury, and we, wouldn't, we only get it because of Roxbury. Because we merged voluntarily, we'll continue to get it, and at that level. Um, there are several special education revenues that we get from the state. Um, the intensive is a significant decrease from FY19 because our expenses are lower and it's based on 56% of your expenses there. The block grant is formula driven and it relates to like the 
cost of staff, so you do see that go up usually, which it did. Um, extraordinary is going down because that is only if you have students who um, their cost exceeds $50,000 this year or $60,000 next year. So when you have a, a, a high cost student, once they hit that threshold, you get 90% reimbursement instead of just 56. Um, we're seeing a decrease in that line because we anticipate less uh, students in that situation. Um, and also, they raised the threshold to 60,000, so it takes more to get to that threshold. Um, state place students, the revenue for that is a lot lower, and the reason why is just we anticipate less state place students next year. Um, I'll skip down a few lines here. Transportation aid, um, a little bit of an increase. That's the one that will go up significantly if we do busing this year in two years. Um, if you skip down to Idea B and then those CFP lines, those are federal funds. So Idea B is special education funds that are federally sourced. CFP is Consolidated Federal Program. That's Title I, Title IIA funding that we were just talking about a little earlier. You'll see that we broke out Title I and Title IIA separately now. And you'll see that in total, it's a little less money that we're counting on because funding typically is thought to be drying up. Um, rentals, miscellaneous, and interest, those are local sources, local revenue sources, and they're just kind of associated with what we're seeing in prior years as actuals. Balance forward is where we would plug in fund balance if we were going to use fund balance as a revenue source. Um, and Tripoli is not much. Uh, you, there's actually two lines left, EPSDT and one that says IEP. Those are both Medicaid, so federal Medicaid funding. Um, the idea B, CFP, and Medicaid, all the revenue you see here is exactly how much we plan to spend. So if we're going to spend $365,000 in CFP money, we're showing $365,000 in revenue here. So those don't really cost the community anything because it's an expense and the revenue taken back out. So, thanks. Capital plan, um, this is a probably about 1% of the budget, uh, which is reasonable. Uh, we intend to show it as a separate article and establish it as a separate fund this year. That way the money can roll over from year to year for those years down the road where we might have to save money over a couple of years in order to do a project. Um, and that for audience, that means a separate vote. It's a separate article, so you'll see it in the warning as a separate article that will be voted on, correct. Um, the 260,000 though has already been factored into the tax rate calculation that you're going to see later. It's not, you know, you don't have to worry about oh what it, and what it's going to be. What is what is it going to be if we pass this 260? It's already assumed by me that you're going to pass that in there. Um, you're going to notice that Roxbury is not on this list, not because you know we forgot about them. Um, their building is in very good shape, which we knew going into this merger. The roof is good, the heat plant's good, so there's not anything in the foreseeable future that we would put on this capital plan for Roxbury. That doesn't mean we're not spending money. We spent a decent amount of money on the kitchen this year. We're gonna spend a decent amount of money from the general fund um, for some bathroom renovation work and town hall work. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar, the town hall is part of the school. It's like the auditorium, cafeteria, town hall. Gym. Gym. <laughs> it's, it's the cafe gym, atorium, town hall is what it is. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, you will see that Main Street Middle School is on here a lot, and that's because the bond took care of a lot of things at Union and at the high school. There wasn't anything in the bond for Main Street. Um, the 260 that you see in FY20 is what we showed that we were going to do in FY20 last year. So it's still there. That's what we're gonna do. And Libby spoke about that a little bit earlier as far as when the bids are gonna be going out. Um, the future year requirements, don't get too excited about. Um, you know, FY21 and out, we've got, we've got time to look at that. You know, uh, Andy, Andrew's been here for, what, six months now, seven months? Um, so we're going to dig further into this, but at least Andrew and the facilities folks have got a good picture of what some of the big requirements are out there and they're tracking them. They might shift them around a little bit, the cost might change a little bit, but at least we have a plan that we can react to and adjust. 
So now what you all have been waiting for, the tax rates, um, I wish I could say they're final. They kind of are if you live in Roxbury, um, but not for Montpelier. Um, this chart shows all the math behind it. You'll see the mathematical equations on the far left. Um, equalized pupils, I've mentioned it several times, is the big unknown. If that number goes up by seven kids, the tax rate in Montpelier drops by a penny. So hopefully the equalized pupil count is low and we'll be able to bump that up and have better news going forward. Um, I said to Roxbury residents, their tax rate is pretty much final. And that is because, and I'll stand up to show you this. Um, down here, this adjusted residential rate, really at some point is gonna be one number for both Montpelier and Roxbury. But by statute, as long as we're getting this incentive, Roxbury's rate can only drop by 5%. So this times 95% is $1.654. It can't go any lower than that by statute. So no matter, I could cut a million dollars out of this budget, that number can't change. I could add a million dollars and it probably isn't gonna be enough to make it go up any higher. So Roxbury, that's your equalized residential rate. This is the common level of appraisal. That means Roxbury's tax rate is $1.703. Um, so it's about 1.2 cents higher than this current year. That's less than a percentage. Um, but you can see it's, 5% lower as far as what we could do with it, but this is killing us, this 5% drop in CLA. Can't do anything about that. That's why this ends up being an increase instead of a decrease. On the Montpelier side, this number will change as other numbers change. If this goes up by seven kids, this number goes down by a penny. So this number will still change. The CLA is a known number now. So that doesn't change. But hopefully this number comes in higher, which will drop that number and this number. And you know, we'll, we'll see as, as uh, time goes by. The Montpelier rate is an increase of 6.4 cents right now. That's 4%. Um, hopefully it'll be less. CLA is obviously the big driver. You can't really see it on this slide, but if CLA was level, as I mentioned it before, Roxbury's rate would be 9.7 cents lower. Um, Montpelier's would be 4.8 cents of that, 6.4. All right, if you go on. So the tax rate impacts. Grant, that last slide said 4.8. Is that before the new CLA? What, what? what am I seeing? They're increasing Montpelier rate by 4.8 cents. The CLA, because the CLA is 97 instead of 100, or instead yeah, yeah, of 90. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wait, where is it? 89 instead of right. 92. Yeah. That, really if I change this number to 92.31, the Montpelier tax rate would drop by 4.8 cents. So 4.8 of the 6.4 is just because I had to change the CLA number. Oh, it, it, okay. The CLA is driving 4.8 cents. I got it. Um, the next slide, I guess we shouldn't get too excited about for Montpelier because things are still changing, but yeah. if you look at what the tax rate impacts, <laughs> if you look at how the tax rate impacts you based on your property value, so if you have $200,000 worth of property, your tax rate would go up by $128 as of right now. Um, Roxbury's tax rate uh, is pretty much just based on the CLA. You can see their impact if they have a $200,000 um, property, they, their tax rate will go up $24. The last note is very important though. This assumes that you're paying purely based on property and we know statewide about two thirds of the people get income sensitivity adjustment. So this is like the worst case scenario um, that you pay purely based on property value, which most people don't. Um, and it also assumes our equalized pupil that count doesn't get any better, which hopefully it will. But that's where we stand right now. Um, this chart shows the non-residential tax rates. Um, it's a statewide base rate divided by the common level of appraisal for the community. So as the note says, our budget has nothing to do with non-residential tax rates. But we show it to you anyway. So Outlook, um, Libby mentioned it before, when we built this year's budget, we were thinking about FY20. Now that we're building FY20's budget, we're thinking about FY21, 22, 23. 
because we don't want crazy tax rate swings. We want to make tax rates pretty sustainable. So we know that the merger incentive is going to drop two cents every year. To make up for that, we would have to cut the budget by about 250 to 275,000. Um, so that's in the back of our head. How are we going to reduce costs or increase revenues or do something to help um, moderate that? We know enrollment and staffing are both going to increase, but if they both increase, then spending per pupil shouldn't be impacted. So that's pretty much level. Um, we know some expenditures are going to decrease, which will help with that incentive issue. Um, one less grandparented uh, group of kids every year means less tuition. Um, we know that we can probably cut back some more on facility projects to get back to the level that we were in FY18. Um, we know transportation aid is going to increase, so more revenues coming up in the future years. Um, and we know we don't have to deal with a $250,000 increase in bond expenses that we dealt with this year. So bond expenditures are actually going to drop just a little bit, but not much, but they're not going to increase. So those are some things that we know are coming in the future that we'll keep in mind. Um, the budget summary, I don't really need to say too much about this. There's still that big one unknown for Montpelier, which is equalized pupils. I mentioned what the increases are in the total budget, the education spending. As far as residential tax rates are concerned, the increase for Montpelier is still to be determined. Roxbury is increasing a small amount, but that's because of the CLA drop. You want the last slide? Okay, so I start out with questions, but I do want to jump real quick to changes first. I'm, these are on here in case anybody has questions or anybody wants to make changes. But the one change I want to point out that hasn't been talked about, I um, took another snapshot of employees and their health care coverage. And this time, remember last time it was bad news, we had people that were going up. This time we have people that are going down. We have some people that are going from two person to going on to their spouse. So two person to zero. And we have a couple of folks that are going from family coverage down to parent child coverage. So just to let you know, without you making me make any changes, the next time I come back, expenses are probably going to be about $48,000 lower in the healthcare area. Not to get too excited about it, 48,000 is about three tenths of a cent. Um, but that's one thing that I will be changing voluntarily. And I'll turn it back over to you, Jim, to manage questions and talk about any other changes. Thanks. Great. So uh, we have scheduled um, you know, public comment. So uh, yeah, if folks want to ask questions, uh, make comments. Um, 30 minutes, right? Yeah. <laughs> so that's what you said. I uh, took 30 minutes total. Not 30 minutes for you, I'm looking, at the, I'm looking at the line. I got 30 minutes. Um, uh, my name is Nathan Suter. I have two kids in the schools. My wife teaches here. Um, thank you all for your service as school board members. I'm sure it's 9.30 for you just like it is for me. Um, thank you for the administrative staff who are here. Andrew, I've never met. Uh, Grant and Libby, who I know have been, or I've heard, and I can only imagine, have been working extremely hard for the last six months, and Grant before that. Um, so you may not hear that enough, but thank you. Um, uh, Libby, just want to appreciate the, your humility earlier this evening, which um, I think is important as a as a as a character trait that we all hope for in ourselves. So. <laughs> um, and then, uh, what does that note mean? I have no idea what that note means. Um, uh, and I, I think that the, I love budgeting in organizations because I see it as an expression of our values. And um, so my, my internal narrative is different from Grant's maybe, or you know, when he says, the, the moment we've all been waiting for, which is about tax rates. <laughs> and I'm like, no, God damn it, the moment I've been waiting for is how are we making our students better? You know, and how are we making this community better? And, um, and I, I love that the, this board is organized around, or the district is organized around ends, right, what are the outcomes? Um, and so 
this budget is about what's important to us, and then as we, you know, we saw tremendous outpouring of interest when it came to community connections, which is phenomenal. I don't know how many other districts would see this kind of turnout for anything. Um, and then we used to get to see these, we're well not here anymore, these graduates who are succeeding in their lives uh, in tremendous ways at these great institutions, having done community-based learning. Um, and so then I, then the downbeat for me hits, and I, I wonder, you know, what's, what's the front row of the kids who are not at Stanford? And where are they? And the, the <coughs> fourth graders who are in my son's class right now, uh, who, was that, 10? So nine years from now, they will be in their first year of college? Will they be in their first year of who knows, right? The work you do today, the work you guys do is you put together this budget and put together your staff uh, has, I think, a tremendous impact on this community. And I, you know, I see, uh, I see humans, adults in our world who struggle every day, who need tremendous amounts of support. Um, and I ask myself, what can I be doing? And I also ask, what can we be doing collectively? Because that's that's Christmas future, right? We can see that. Where's you know what are we doing right now to sort of prevent that and, and forestall those fates? And so I want to you know my ask to Libby and to the team is how are we meeting the academic needs? You know is one more social emotional learning person at the elementary school of almost 500 kids? Is that what we need? Is that anywhere near what we need? Um, I'm glad that we didn't just cut the person who's no longer eligible for federal, you know, Title I funds, right? Okay, that's a moment of courage. Is it enough? And I would say it's probably not enough. I mean, just looking at my daughter's classes and my son's classes, and when we do the math on, in the fifth grade, uh, if we have four teachers equaling 20, almost 25, almost 26 kids per class, well, if you do the math on that number and you add one more teacher, you're still at 20 or 19 or something like that. And it's actually not below the bottom of your window. And that might equate to excellence as opposed to squeaking past, right? Um, what is happening? I watch what's happening in my son's class and how his class and his learning and the learning of his peers is impacted by students around him who need tremendous amounts of support, <coughs> be it social, emotional, or academic. And if we're, if we're not, and, I, and I've seen that in a number of different classes, not just that class. Um, so. I'm mindful that we're not, if we're, if we're doing more, we're not just helping the students with great need. The students with greatest need theoretically are on IEPs and are getting more support. But again, if you're not in that super, super low tranche, what, what support are you getting? And if, if we are being champions for those kids as a district, if we are a district of privilege, which is as evidenced by the lack of funding that we're getting, you know, we no longer qualify for this stuff, okay. So we've got a lot of dough, right? We, we are, a, you know, like where are the people who play flute and how can they help Alex make CC or whatever it becomes even better? Okay, if that's our community, like let's, let's instead of, oh, the money went away, we can't serve that, those kids anymore. No, let's step up and serve those kids. Let's be courageous. Our not equalized pupil, because I know it's not the same, but our enrollment last year to this year jumped 65 students according to the numbers in this display, right? Yeah. And we're projecting equalized pupils flat for the purpose of this budget. And we're saying, oh, it's only going up 2%. Last year, it went up 8%. Last year, it went, eight, eight, went up 8%, and our tax rate had almost no impact because we're gaining kids, right? Like, now's the time to be aggressive. Now's the time to, like, invest in the capacity to serve those high-need kids, to serve all of our community, and I want to see you do that. And I, frankly, am not, you know, I hear, like, well, we're still getting our feet on the ground. We're figuring out our systems. Um, I hear that argument academically. I don't hear. I don't feel it emotionally. I feel like, you know, show me the action. Show me the movement. Like, okay, we're going to make a livable wage for our food service workers, and we're going to stop uh, trimming their hours by an, you know an hour a week so they don't get health care. Good. Where's that behavior across the board? So I I just want to I challenge the board and I challenge the administration to think aggressively about how to make these kids' lives amazing. Are they thriving? Are we excellent? Um, 
our folks who are behind grade level advancing to grade level, our folks who are at grade level advancing, you know, accelerating beyond that. Um, I think that's what this community has the capacity to be. It doesn't matter whether you are a child of non-college background or if you're a child of, you know, two parents with advanced degrees, everybody should be accelerating because we should have that capacity in this community. I'd like to see us show it. Um, that's it. Oh, that's not it. <laughs> that's not it. That's so great. Um, the, uh, I know that you're making a committee to steer the administration as far as how to deal with community connections. Um, and I appreciate that that process has sort of slowed down and shifted a little bit. Um, my questions are, is there, I, I hear some of the urgency for why to jettison CC and try something else for next year. I'm also hearing that that sounds pretty complicated. And I wonder if the district might take a, a little bit deeper breath and say, hey, maybe we keep this little Frankenstein that doesn't work perfectly, but works pretty well in some ways. And maybe we add something to it that in, you know, the idea of becoming a hybrid and then moving to the new thing. Because transition, as you guys will have experienced this year, can be challenging. Um, and, and I think that the, the RFP, I share, st I think, Steve's concern and perhaps others, which is, at the end of the day, <coughs> this is an administrative decision. I think the administration heard about as clearly as they can hear about what the community expects. And I didn't hear you actually resolve, like, direct the administration to do an RFP process. So I'm hoping that that committee has the power to, to look at the options and say to the administrative team, well, maybe we don't have to do that process, but we can do something well. That's it. Thanks very much, you guys. I have comments. So I wanted to come and express my support for busing because I worked hard on that and I know you guys did too and I'm really excited to see it in the budget. So thank you for listening to us. Um, I echo uh, Suzanne's concern, especially with the fifth grade class at Main Street Middle School, which has a very large class size, a lot of soci uh, social and emotional needs. And one of the things I wondered about, um, which is probably not feasible for this year, but is the ability to have teachers uh, flex their grades as they as it looks like over the next five years you're going to have a lot of class sizes where some are a lot smaller and others are bigger so is there an ability for a fourth grade teacher to become a first grade teacher or a first grade teacher to become a fifth grade teacher when that capacity arises and i know as a state employee not testifying in that capacity <laughs> that would be a union issue so something to explore going forward um because i know I think that would address some parental concerns that we have had, especially with that particular class, with maybe allowing some flexibility within the administration. Don't know if you've explored that. Um, one of the things I was wondering about from a budget perspective is around the Main Street Middle School, which often feels like a jail when you walk in there. And, and I don't say that nicely, but it really does. It's, it's not a very pleasant In terms of facilities or in terms of just overall feeling? Facility. Facilities, okay. Yes, no, the, the staff, that was not, like just, uh, you walk in, it's concrete walls, yeah. small windows, just seems like a jail. Um, I'm wondering if there's a district plan for long-term capacity on looking at that building. It isn't built into any of the plans, but it's singing Jim's praises right now. <laughs> hey, look, Union is, is an older school, but it's pretty. I mean, I, I come here and I go, this is gorgeous. I go to Main Street Middle School and I say, what's wrong with our community? Um, it's a school that we threw the fifth grade into it. I just, I just wonder, I as a taxpayer would be willing to, to spend some money to do that or endorse a bond or whatever you need. But um, it would be nice as a community for us to start thinking about that long term. Um, the other thing I wondered is around a staffing assessment and if you've done that, having a consultancy firm come in. Talk more about that. So um, 
a lot of times consultancy firms can come in and do long-term staffing assessments, looking at organizations' needs across the board, thinking over the next five years what really makes sense from a standpoint. You thought the fact that you don't have an HR coordinator astounded me for 200 employees. That would be something they would highlight. Also looking at areas of uh, redundancy or areas for uh, efficiency, but also looking at your future needs. So we've heard a lot around teachers, soci uh, social emotional support. Those are things that the district needs. Um, there's some great consultancy firms out there that do that. There's also just the ability to do it on a local level. Um, so I just wondered, you know, are you making the decisions based solely on the class size ratios, or are you also thinking, and just the teacher's needs, or are you guys thinking of, let's look at the system as a whole, what do we want to achieve in five years, what do we want our school district to look like in five years, and then how can we use vacancies or, um, you know, ch the changes in the administration that naturally happen to be able to build into that long-term plan. More just an idea, just just thoughts. That's all I have, but I really did want to just stay to say thank you for including busing in the budget because it will make a huge difference to me and my family. It's dedication. <laughs> hey, you know, I was yes, here. And, and thanks for your <laughs> participation. Thank you for coming yeah. and staying. <laughs> so, uh, she participated in some you know, discussions with, with yeah. me and others, too, that I know she took time out of working. It's important. Yeah, it's, there are lots of things turning in the back of my head about it. <laughs> I, you know, it's just one of those unfortunate things. You know, walk into a school and to have that as the environment. And I'm not saying it can be fixed overnight, but it'd be really nice when my 18-month-old is in school as a fifth grader for it maybe to be a little bit of a different environment. I have to say, I taught in that school for 10 years, and. It's been improved since then. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. But, you know, is that school really going to meet our community's needs in 25 years? No. And it takes 10 years to build a school, right? One thing some of us have been talking about is the need for <laughs> sort of a larger um, community discussion and to build a consensus around what to do with our middle school. If there are these things that come up that are predicaments and we don't necessarily, we can't just proceed, sometimes we can't proceed because we don't have consensus. And it, with with the uh, Washington Central going, kind of being faced with the challenges of, of, of now kind of a forced simplification, kind of our, our approach or our conversation with them has to go on hold in terms of that kind of a regional collaboration. But um, the building has always been a piece of that larger conversation about the use of buildings throughout Central Vermont. And so at some point, we need to have a community conversation to create a consensus around what we want to do. And we just haven't done it yet. I would be happy to participate in that <laughs> outside of the legislative right. session. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like you already are. <laughs> okay. Anything else? Any board questions or is the board, board happy comments? With the budget as it is? Huh? is the board happy with the budget as it is? <clears throat> this is when you would direct the administration to do anything different, correct? Right? Not yet. I mean, so far from the data that we've been able to see, the, just the open question of the equalized student is just hanging out there. Jim, I think this is one of the big things on the table right now, the question about whether we put, whether we feel like this rate is, is on the edge and therefore we want to be putting some one-time funds into that or not. And it seems that that's something we've at this point been resistant to do because we know we're just kicking the can down the road for the next problem. Um, but that is one of the, the few things we could do in this budget. Um, I mean, we haven't we haven't said you know take busing out or any of those things yet. But those kind of hard conversations at some point, you know, when do we do those things? Um, Libby, you wanna? Yeah, I just wanted to respond, Nathan, to some of the things you you talked about um, in terms of uh, you and I have, and we've talked about it, have incredibly similar goals for Montpelier Roxbury schools in terms of, I'm on, I want to knock this place out of the park, right? I want to be the best in Vermont be, and have data to prove it, to, data to back it up. I'm right there with you on that. Um, just so um, the community knows, the first six months, we have slowly and painstakingly um, with staff, as I'm sure Morgan has come home and told you, about, um, to having conversations of what do we believe for all kids. Um, 
around, that's culture. So we've been working on our culture. And when I say this whole room is packed with teachers, we do it once a month. It's packed with teachers um, rather uncomfortably at times. And we've truly been working on um, the idea of do we all believe that chil children will learn at high levels because of what we do with them every day? Um, and there's some debate about that amongst our staff. And I'm not saying that as a, as a um, knock on our staff. That's just where we are right now. Um, so people might cross out the word will and say can, which is a different connotation. They can if they choose to, right? So if they come to school ready, if they come to school with parents having read to them, if they come to school with a certain socioeconomic status or language, then they, they yeah, sure, they can learn. Um, so we're, we're really having hard conversations right now about that piece. Um, I agree with you. We do not have the staffing that we need in order to truly support all the learning and social emotional needs of our kids. We don't. We absolutely, it's glaringly obvious to me as an educator um, and as an administrator. However, um, I didn't add, or I didn't um, ask to put that piece in the budget this year because our system also isn't in place to support. We, we would be adding people to a broken system. And so we really need to think, I think we need to think about how do we first get our culture in line that, yeah, we can do this. We have the efficacy, we have the collective efficacy to do this. We can, we will. Um, we don't know necessarily how to do that, but we're willing to put ourselves out there to do it. Um, and once we're, once we're there, or we have the vast majority there, <laughs> um, then we can really think about, let's ensure that the systems and structures that we have in place are truly working together. Let's ensure our PLCs, are, our professional learning communities are looking at the right stuff. Let's ensure that we have a common curriculum that's vertically aligned K-12 across all our buildings, that we're truly knowing exactly what learning targets we're hitting. Um, let's ensure that we have all those pieces in place. Those are the kind of pieces that we're gonna be working on this year and next year that don't cost money. They're time and resources. So we're thinking about how do we use our resources really well. Um, and once we have those things in place, then we can start talking about, okay, let's look at our staffing. What do we need? And this, this isn't addressing staff, uh, class size. It's more of additional staffing in terms of interventionists, in terms of instructional coaches. We're one of the only districts in the state, I think, who doesn't have an instructional coach for our teachers. You know, so, so how are we looking at those pieces? What are, when we say, welcome to Montpelier Roxbury teacher, new teacher, this is what we believe in how we teach. Um, does everybody have a common definition of what that means? And right now, if I ask five different teachers, I get five different answers. So it's, we're working on a lot of things around our beliefs and around our systems and around our structures. And yes, I agree with you. We're gonna get there. I promise, <laughs> we're gonna get there. We just have to, we can't add people to a broken system. And, and may I say before you say, <laughs> that you've heard me say before, just throwing money at it doesn't make it better. And so I, I applaud Libby on trying to figure out how it is exactly we need to get better, and then we can say, this is what we need to spend to get better. Go ahead. Um, so thank you for that. With respect, I, I don't agree that these things must come be completely resolved before the next step is taken. Oh yeah, they won't be. And, and I also think that um, you, you just said, oh, these things aren't about money, they're about time. When I look at uh, Morgan and her peers and their time spend and their mental presence and you know, recently being asked to participate in a, I think it was a math curriculum development, you know, half day professional day, whatever, um, that's capacity. And capacity may not always be money, but if, you're, if, you're, um, if your choice is to uh, create sub plans for a class where you're concerned about it, about the management of the class and the you know, learning progress on any given day in order to give yourself to this other laudable goal of professional learning, what do you call it? Uh, professional learning communities. Right, PLCs. Um, that's about capacity, whereas if things are well supported and under control in your classroom or in your grade level, uh, you may actually have the capacity to participate mm -hmm. in that in a productive way and accelerate this process. Mm -hmm. And if, um, if not every faculty member, not every teacher is 
at the is it a shared values position or shared belief system position or a shared skills system in terms of uh, multi-tier, et cetera. Um, how how are how are we as a district providing them the capacity and support, be that time, be that professional development, whatever that is, to gain those skills and accelerate and, and make those changes, um, perhaps sometimes with persistence and perhaps sometimes willingly, but just, you know, with mm -hmm. that capacity. So um, I'm not suggesting we throw money on it, Tina. I'm suggesting that we invest in good people. As a, as a new administrator, I can imagine it would be tremendously valuable to you to be able to hire people in your own vision, right? <coughs> if you're the one having the conversation as they come in. As a teacher in Monk and Roxbury, here's what I think, and here's, you know, there's, there's a level of autocracy here, here, right? And the ability for you to bring people in in that mold is, I think, extremely valuable. And to convey that down the chain of command and to take participation up the chain of command. So I encourage greater investment. I would reject this current budget, and I, if I were the board, I would say, you just said out loud, we do not have enough, we do not have uh, you know, enough interventions or enough co instructional coaches. Like, get it. We're gonna have, we're gonna have 20 more equalized pupils than we have projected here. That's three times seven. You said seven was a, was a penny. You know, that's, that's right. Wait, you said we're going to have 20 more equalized people? Then, then you're projecting, that's my guess. I can't even calculate that right now. I, I know. You just, yeah, I'm, just betting. Do. I'm just betting, right? So I'm, I'm, just, I'm watching what. <laughs> well, I'd be surprised if it's that many, but I, it's, I think you should do it's, it's, it's a crystal ball. But <laughs> I, I'm, I'm asserting that I think that we're being, I think that we are consistently being conservative in the way that we project our budgets. In the last two years, I've been surprised as heck. It's been different even between when, when it gets warned and put on the ballot to when it actually, you know, the ballot number last year wasn't even the fact the real tax impact, right? Because it was the number was old. Not your fault, but, right? The legislature and, and the yeah. law changed right. and they changed the dollar yield, right. which I had thought that so, right. So I'm just saying, like, that. let's be aggressive. Let's be the community that has awesome schools. Let's do the best we can, even though it's an imperfect system. We're, we're gonna fix it while it's flying in the air. That is what it is, and I just want you to be more aggressive about it, with respect. Mm -hmm. okay. um, does the district do strategic planning? Yeah, where we are engaging in it. That makes sense. So at the end of the strategic planning, will you publish like your... Oh, absolutely. And that would lead to the ask, I'm guessing, at that point? Yeah, it, it determines it and continues. The newest term from the Agency of Education is continuous improvement planning for CIP. Yeah. Using like lean or that type of method. Um, it changes yearly what they ask us to do. <laughs> when do you guys expect to have the strategic plan public? Uh, well, we'll, we'll, we've been in the process relatively since we started. Um, we'll target it more um, this, or this spring in February, March with leadership teams in each building. Yep. Um, and have, the goal is to have the override, overall district vision and goal and then where each school comes into that. What's, what's each, where is each school so that we differentiate it by school because and thinking about what they, what they really need to target and need. So for instance, if it's, um, if our goal is to create an effective multi-tiered system of support for, as a district, which I have a good hunch because I'm a superintendent, it will be. Um, <laughs> then that that one piece has several factors yep. to it. Whereas Roxbury need, might need to work on something that the high school not, might necessarily not, but the high school needs to work on something that you know. So so where do they see themselves? And we right now we're building a common understanding of what that means um, at the administrative level. Um, so we're working on that piece right now, and that will come out. In the spring, we have to have that in place for our for our federal funding, anyway, which we can't get unless we have it in place. That's great, and it presumably is a multi-year strategic. Yes. Plan. Yes. Go on. Grant had some questions about dates. Well, the, um, the dates, <coughs> January 2nd has a question mark because the budget calendar I gave you initially at the beginning of this had a potential for a January 9th meeting. 
it's not a regularly scheduled meeting and I have a question mark there because I'm not sure that you want to do it. Um, one of the reasons why is because I'm not sure I'm going to have an equalized pupil number by then. So I'm not sure how much I'm going to be able to, what new information I'm going to be able to give you. Um, it does put a little pressure though because January 16th when we go through this again and ha hopefully have the answers, you'll probably need to approve, we'll have to look at the calendar and the timelines for warnings, but it may be that the 16th is the day that you'll have to approve the budget and approve the articles. So we may have to do some real time stuff that night and I can have my budget file so that we can decide, like as Steve mentioned, if at the last minute we see we're at you know, 6.1 cents and we really want to get under 6 cents, how much would we have to add? We can figure that out. So my, my gut feeling was that maybe we wouldn't do the January 9th since I don't think we'll have any more information, but we will do the 16th and we'll try to be able to do everything we have to that night to be able to can you, resolution. can you just say you think that you'll have the equalized per people numbers or the the equalized 16th. people numbers rather not per people by the 16th? So the I hope yeah. so. I've already gotten a rough draft yeah. and the rough draft was 30 kids less than what I just showed you on that slide, yeah. which scares the yeah. Yeah. That would be bad. But you found the, the CLA ended up being They are missing yeah. some key information. Like yeah. They're missing a year's worth of ELL data that we're trying to sort through with them. And so that swing right now, it could be dramatic. And yeah. right now we're on the low side, but I do think that once the data gets in there, depending on the statewide equalizing factor, which is 94.273652 or something like that, I don't know what that equalizing factor is gonna be either. Yeah. But I would hope certainly that by January 16th, we will get something from the AOE that they call frozen. I would hope by then, as well as six semester average, but that's, that's really not a big deal at all. It's really that one. Yeah, so kind of my question to the board, you know, given the time frame, um, as the third budget, budget, the budget presentation we've had, uh, you know, my sense is that there's pretty high level of support with the board. I think everyone shares Nathan's concern and vision, but I also think yeah, you know, we've we've listened hard to Libby that you know her goal is to add capacity to to deal with the equity issues. Um, but you know, right now she's doing system evaluation, she's looking at things and you know, adding adding without knowing where to add to. Um, right now is is not where we're at. Um, but I'd love to give a sense if, if people, one, if my read is right, um, because I think that would determine whether or not we want to do something January 9th. Um, because if we need to approve the 16th, we're not going to have, <coughs> we're not going to be able to do the 16th other than the first one. And if you got the equalized people spending number, you could generate the updates and send it out to the board before the 16th so we can look at it. And that would be very helpful. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, there's nothing new by the night. I don't know why we need to meet. I agree. Do we, do we think that we might be interested? Yeah, I, I, I agree with not meeting on the night, but do we think we might want to do some if we thought we might might make some changes on the 16th, would we want to try and have another meeting in succession? I don't know if that would make sense or not. Like a couple of days later, like or early the following week, do we have to do it on Wednesday kind of thing? I don't know. You mean have a or just have on Wednesday and then have one following it that week? Yeah, or or a week later. I don't know if it's going to be necessary. Might be the end of it. So the 16th, we think, would be the absolute last day of it. We'll have to look at what the 30 to 40 day window is. I haven't done the math to figure it out yet, but it's getting close on the 16th. To, um, to March 5th? We have a little more time. Or 5th is the, 5th is town meeting. 4th yeah. is information hearing. So it's gotta be. we have to go back 30 to 40 days from the 5th, then that's the window. Is it has to go to the printer for the, is it gonna go in the city? 
Yes, it'll be in the city in Montpelier's and Roxbury's articles. Right, so, so we'll have to figure out when their dates are. Yeah. Typically, yeah. we have to get it to them before the Pension Tree Council meeting. That's the week after our meeting. Okay. So the 24th. The, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so, we have so, January, so if, if January 24th. If, if, actually, January 24th. Actually, pass on this timeline. The window to post budget warning is January 24th to February 3rd. So January 23rd is the following. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, I'm just, yeah, we've seen this presentation three times. Uh, it's a good presentation. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we, we Grant's got it down cold. Yeah. Uh, I myself. Yeah. He's just as excited every time. Yeah. <laughs> I know, you have to like hold yourself back. You can't go to this quick lap. I got to make camp. I know. You noticed the subtle innovations this time. Yeah, thank you. Uh, it sounds like you're saying that. I just couldn't wrap it up. We could, we could do. Special. Yeah, and I and I don't see any percolating issues that required us needing to meet earlier because they're obviously. Is that coming there? Oh, I mean, I think ultimately maybe we don't even need to have a conversation. But is there a, a threshold at which we're concerned about the tax rate? I mean, that's kind of a. I guess we can you know when we see it kind of a thing. We don't want to get in there too much, but. Um, that will be the driving factor. Yeah. I think every, unless every single star aligns. Yeah, I mean, if, if there's something scary about the text, I, I mean, I, yeah, this honestly is about as kind of conservative a budget as a public board. Yeah. I, 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 think it's, I think it's steady. I think it's building on a foundation. Uh, I think there's some, you know, good build, building pieces in there. Uh, Modest initiatives. I, yeah, but I think yeah. If, if we had a bad surprise with equalized pupils and it shot the tax rate to five percent, I think at five percent we have to think about it. Yeah. Um, right now it's at four percent. Yeah, which yeah will will cause it's con consternation. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, and I think we have to be mindful of that. But I also yeah, this is not. Um, yeah, this is this is a transition stabilizing budget where we're a new district, um, a new administration that's looking at things. Uh, yeah, it, it's that that four percent is not representing a, a really aggressive you know, spending. Here. Unfortunately, though, I feel like and we've talked. Libby is the first one to acknowledge this. We don't really have the best of data right now to make the type of informed decisions that we want to make to better staff our district. Yeah, make so I mean, we're not we're not making decisions that we want to make. Like, yeah. We can't yeah. get our teacher data in uniform across all of our schools. I mean, yes. Yeah. yeah no, I mean the reasons for it being the way it is make a lot of sense, uh, but I think you know. Yeah, if this was if this was the budget where we were going for you know some some major growth and major spending based on that analysis and we got a scary tax rate um, or an iffy tax rate, then you know, some discussions about you know how we're spending. But uh, yeah, I mean, I, I I mean we're kind of at the point where. And you know, let me know if it's wrong. Where if we start cutting to get to like a three or two percent, mm -hmm. um, it's it's got to be it's gonna be bare bone. Bare bone, yeah. And, and we certainly do not want to do that. At least I don't. Even at four percent, I'm like, I don't like. I'm like, what am I really getting at four percent increase? Like, I'm not getting anything good. You know, really, it's kind of. Well, a number of a number of working like I, I like you know what I mean like I'm just saying it from like <laughs> horseshoes and hand grenades like coming in and looking at it, I'm like like and I'm gonna say it again but like give me some teachers give me something that touches the students you know what I mean I don't need another parking lot I need like a teacher I need someone like I, like what do I see in this budget like I don't see anything like of from like our community values truly being met and still increasing at four percent are you pretty unsatisfied with um, I just want more teachers. Like I've been saying this for yeah. quite a long time, and, and I think it has a huge impact. And I don't think the cost is a lot. Like, what would a teacher be? Like, 
75,000, not <coughs> like including benefits? Mm -hmm. I like, the, like I like the statistics to say where that teacher goes. So I know you put yeah. that, where you put that teacher. No, but, but I think so just in general, like there's this bubble that comes through. I'm watching this bubble come through, and they have been ignored since I started complaining about this. How many years ago? Yeah. So, I, I mean, you know my I mean? thought is, I mean, we So put the teacher there, like, because it's still growing. And people are still coming to our town. Like, we have growth. Yeah. It's I, not like the teacher's not going to be utilized. Yeah, I, I think we've gotten lucky the last couple of years that we've been able to increase the budget fairly substantially and add some stuff without hitting a tax. You know, really, in fact, we actually had decreases in the last couple of years, yeah. minorly. Yeah, I think some of the numbers that have been working against the state aren't working for us the way they were previously, which is why you're seeing the four percent. I think we have a, I think we've, you know, grown the budget. I think we have a. A really good opportunity right now with a new administration that um, is really, I think, taking a good systematic and structural look at how we're spending our money to figure to make sure we're getting the most out of what we're spending and where we need to build and keep keep spending and where maybe we're overspending. We need to, to do some shifting around. Um, so I think that's what we're getting. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's exciting. And then we are getting some exciting things. Yeah, you know, we've been talking about foreign language for years, and this is the first budget I've ever seen with a, with a meaningful step that could lead to foreign language mm -hmm. at the elementary school. Um, I think that's big, and we've been talking about things like you know busing, which I think is a big equity and safety issue, also yeah. for years. Sure. And yeah, this this budget is adding that. So there are some key pieces that I've been hearing from the community. Yeah. That are being addressed here, and, and, and facility-wise too, like we yeah. really kind of falling down. Like yeah, the and the ago. you know, and yeah. you know, the capital plan is putting you know some structure in place uh, to keep up with maintenance. Um, you know, we we did the bond last year. I think we like, started seeing some of the projects come to fruition. Um, so I think we're at a good place and a, a good good building place. I mean, I wish we could do it with a, a slightly better tax situation, but I, I think we've got a good story to tell. Is there a concern from voters that they're going to shoot down the budget? I, I mean, I guess I just, to me as a, a mom, as a resident, and as someone who approves the school budget every year and who has family who lives in Montpelier who also approves it, I just, I just wonder if that concern is realistic, especially when it's, I'm, and maybe I'm naive, but we're talking about somewhere between you know, 120 and uh, 200 dollars, right, for the average home in Montpelier per they, year. They did vote no four years ago. Four years yeah. ago? Yeah. Okay. And I, I think I agree with Michelle on that. If it goes up, if we're at five percent. The closer it gets you to five percent. Okay. Yeah. I, I didn't. I didn't know. I mean, I just. To me, that your responsibility. Yeah. The interaction with the city budget also that we can't control by the budget. City budget's on the ballot at the same time. It's growing up, and the school budget has increased. People look at it as a whole. It's something we can't do much about. Yeah, and also, I mean, we, we have a very supportive community. We also have an aging community. I mean, if you look at, you know, our our um, our student enrollment is increasing in one of the only towns that are doing that, but if you look at what student enrollment was in the early 90s when the town was relatively the same population, well, we have a much older community. Um, you know, and more community members who are theoretically supportive of school but aren't as involved in the schools, and when they, see, when they start to see certain numbers, um, yeah, who are getting to the point where they're you know, they're retiring, they're on fixed incomes. Um, you know, they start to get certain numbers. There's, we do get to a point where we certainly can't take passive for granted. We're, we're in the oldest state um, in, in the country, and we have one of the oldest cities. Our population has actually been declining since 1960 by like 16%. We just have a nice bump in your general demographic who has kids, so we're been able to enjoy a bump in, in kids, but to actually have the growth that you were talking about, Suzanne, we and this is something outside of our scope, we really need more housing. We're at like zero percent. I was about to say, we yeah. have aging communities, yeah. and the yeah. only yeah. reason why we're getting more people here is because right. my people. neighbors are passing away, and yeah. it's sad. I've, I've or, wanted to bring chicken soup. <laughs> <laughs> Who needs chicken soup? My, yeah, it's okay. <laughs> 75 percent of the houses on my street turned over, and they're either yeah. 
millennials with kids and millennials thinking about having kids. Yeah, oh, that's true. What? Yeah. So it's a whole, that's good. And there's also, do you think that that um, the ten thousand dollar incentive? to bring people to work remotely and move into the states could affect us at all. No. Hopefully. No. No. <laughs> no. Moved Montpelier. <laughs> Uh, wait a second. Um, quick. On appointing to the committee, uh, do we want the board to that or do we want to empower someone to make people? That's my thought. Um, yeah, I, I would say, I would say, Libby or me. Okay. Well, that's helpful. Because I want to keep the good teachers we have. We just increased um, the by how much? Okay. Okay, so amended. Everyone, yay? Yay. 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 Yay